2014's Godzilla, directed by Gareth Edwards. It's good to be back. <laughs> now, where did we leave off? Ah, uh, yes, the end of the Millennium Era, and possibly, in effect, the end of the Suitmation Era of Godzilla, as far as feature-length films go, anyway. When we read about Godzilla history, it's often the case that time is a flat circle. Godzilla movies are made. There's initial success. More are then made in rapid succession. There starts to be diminishing returns. Budgets are cut. Toho then puts Godzilla in mothballs. Years pass. They bring him back again. And on and on it goes. But in 2004, unbeknownst to a lot of people, Toho really might have been done making Godzilla movies. And when I say done, are we talking forever? I would assume no, based off how the history of the series has gone. But after Final War's disappointing box office in Japan and the U.S., along with a poor critical reception, Toho had no real ambitious plans moving forward for bringing the monster star back to the big screen. I would say at the very least, there was a strong possibility that an entire generation could have gone by without a Godzilla movie being made. Even Toho producer Shogo Tomiyama recognized in 2004 that the rise of popular competing forces like Pokemon, for example, were way more popular with kids at the time. Godzilla fans in Japan and the U.S. were becoming older and not enough new young fans were being created. Now fast forward 20 years later to 2024 and we're in a new golden age of abundant Godzilla content that doesn't seem to be slowing down. It begs the question, how did Godzilla go from almost being forced into a potential decades-long hibernation to where he is now, with an American cinematic universe of his own and a Japanese counterpart that even got mainstream critics praising the King of Monsters worldwide? And the Oscar goes to... Godzilla! Yeah! Yeah! Well, it would be silly to say that one person is the sole reason... But I can say it was this man who gave the initial push that got Godzilla to take flight once again and helped revive the Godzilla franchise for an entire generation. That's right, it's our old friend Yoshimitsu Bano, the man who made Godzilla fly. Is it really possible that the guy who quote-unquote ruined the Godzilla series then went on to save it? Let's find out. It's in Japan where the history of how 2014's Godzilla was made begins. But before getting started, if you do not care about the lead up to the movie and some of the things that happened between 2004 and 2014, and you just want to see me break down the movie itself, see timestamp below. Now, I've already covered Yoshimitsu Bano's career after his memorable go with Godzilla and how it would tie into this movie in my Godzilla vs. Hedera video, but... Let me quickly rehash. Years after Godzilla vs. Hedera, Bono still had plans to make Godzilla content. In the early 1990s, Roger Holden would meet with Yoshimitsu Bono multiple times where Holden would come up with the idea of Godzilla 2001, a story where a computer-generated monster breaks out into the real world. In my Godzilla vs. Hedera video, I mistakenly said that Bono came up with this idea, but it was actually Holden's idea that Bono had encouraged him to develop into a full story. Another mistake I made in my video was saying that Bono wanted to create a Hedera sequel with the setting being in Africa, something he denied in an interview with Sci-Fi Japan. Anyway, Holden would craft the Godzilla 2001 story further, and it would turn into, quote, Godzilla fighting a gigantic morphing virtual reality monster, end quote. Holden envisioned the movie would be made with the classic tokusatsu techniques combined with computer graphics. Holden would formally present the story to Toho in 1992, where he met with Bano and special effects director of the Heisei era, Koichi Kawakita. At the time, they were working on Godzilla vs. Mothra. Holden would give a half-hour pitch to Kawakita and Bano. Kawakita found the idea interesting. I mean, of course he did. He probably heard about the monster morphing or transforming throughout the story, so he was like, yeah, sign me up. But he would tell Holden that they wouldn't be able to fund his story, and that they had a lot of story ideas come in on a daily basis. Still, that's pretty awesome that Bono was open to these ideas and gave someone a shot at presenting them to Toho. After 2004's Godzilla Final Wars, there was talks of direct-to-video Godzilla movies being made, but this didn't go anywhere. 
And in retrospect, they probably didn't see the Millennium Era as much of a financial success anyway. This is where Bono stepped in. Though retired from Toho at this point, he knew Toho wasn't going to produce any more Godzilla films unless they were really wowed by a new concept. Bono's pitch to Toho was that if they gave him the rights, he would get a 3D IMAX Godzilla movie made for a U.S. release with a runtime of roughly 40 minutes. He was familiar with the technology of IMAX, as he helped develop the JPAX system, or JPAX, which was similar to IMAX. He thought giant monster movies were perfect for the format because it could emphasize the size and sound of the monsters. Toho would give the green light to Bono, giving him the rights to Godzilla, in a deal much like they had done with TriStar. There were, of course, stipulations. Toho would have to approve any story and monster designs. Perhaps, most importantly, they would not be providing financial support for any potential project. It may surprise some that Toho would give Bono the rights. Despite the notoriously bad initial reaction Tomiyuki Tanaka had to Godzilla vs. Hedera, Yoshimitsu Bono was highly respected at Toho and in Japanese cinema. As for the story of the movie, Bono's first attempt would be called Godzilla vs. Deathla, to the max. The movie would have an estimated runtime of 36 minutes. According to Sci-Fi Japan, the movie would have begun with a chorus of kids singing Return the Sun, a throwback to Godzilla vs. Hedera. In the proposed movie, Deathla would start as a locust-like monster, appearing in the Amazon and consuming the forest, until Godzilla arrives to attack, acting as sort of a protector of nature. At some point in the movie, Deathla would revert to just being one monster. Bono would describe Deathla as being like Hedera, but the creature would be colored red and have a human skull as a face, with spikes running down its back like Godzilla. Deathla would use its locust form to run from Godzilla in the beginning, and in true Bono style, Godzilla uses his ability to fly to chase Deathla around the Earth. The final battle was to take place in New York City with a blizzard going on. Just when it seems like Godzilla is going to lose, children around the world cheer him on, and the monster gets back up and defeats Deathla. There was also supposed to be a moment in the movie during the New York City battle where Godzilla steps in to protect the 9-11 tribute in light. Bono wanted the movie to end with Godzilla looking into the camera and winking at the audience before going back to sleep. Bono couldn't help himself. He would revise the story in 2005, and it was retitled Godzilla 3D to the Max, with the runtime now approaching 40 minutes. Some revisions included Deathla arriving on Earth via meteor, and part of its growth comes from eating off of a New York City garbage dump. Because Toho wasn't putting any money into this, Bono would need to get capital somewhere else, so he and the company White Cat Productions would form a production committee in order to get investors. During this process, the name of the movie would be shortened to just Godzilla 3D, with all references to 9-11 removed. While this second American Godzilla movie was still in its infancy, there would be other monster movies that would release during this time period. In 2005, King Kong, directed by Peter Jackson, was released in the United States, a remake of the 1933 original. This was the second American remake of King Kong. The first American remake was released in 1976. Back in 2005, I always just associated this movie with its video game and the Xbox 360 demo demo that was at my local Toys R Us. And a few years ago, I got to go on the King Kong Movie Universal ride for the first time, which I was most likely intoxicated for, so I don't recall much. But I finally watched the movie for the first time a few months ago. First noteworthy thing is the runtime, over three hours. Damn. Then again, I probably shouldn't comment considering the length of this video. But Jackson's interpretation of Skull Island is absolutely terrifying. It has some of the most disgusting and terrifying creatures I've ever seen, and the natives are truly disturbing. Honestly, I think that's a big part of what makes the King Kong story so tempting to remake. You can basically do whatever you want with Skull Island. It's a canvas for creating disgusting, terrifying monsters. If anything, they went too far because it makes King Kong as a creature seem tame compared to everything else. I mean, there are freaking dinosaurs on the island, which of course was in the first one as well. The spider pit scene or insect pit scene, whatever you want to call it, is by far the scariest eeriest part of the movie. And it's historically significant because since the original King Kong's production, 
There's been this story or myth that's been around for a long time that a spider pit or insect pit scene was shot but cut from the 1933 original due to budgetary reasons. Peter Jackson, I guess for fun, went ahead and made a stop-motion version using production materials from the first movie, bringing this apparent lost media back to life. And it's possibly more disgusting and disturbing than the CG one, simply because the way the insects move in stop motion, it just looks so freaky. Other notable scenes, I'd say, I I mean, I love the scene where Anne makes King Kong laugh. I felt like such a big oaf laughing at that part. (laughs) Monkey. Of course, being the high class and sophisticated film connoisseur that I am, Some of you know I've had nine pictures under my subspecies. I can't talk about this movie without mentioning its most beautifully written moment. Will there be boobies? Boobies? Jigglies, jablongas, bazoons. Anyway, King Kong was a financial success and generally liked by critics. There were talks of a sequel titled Skull Island with the director position being offered to Adam Wingard. As we'd see years later, this would not happen, and instead, Kong Skull Island would release in 2017 to reboot the King Kong franchise once again. And of course, we'd see Mr. Wingard down the line as well. Another important thing happened in 2005. Wikizilla was founded. I know some people don't like wikis or find them unreliable, which is fair, but for a movie franchise shrouded in so many myths and stories that conflict with each other, It's nice for fans to have this site where they can come together on the internet and document or archive Godzilla's history. But you definitely have to be careful. I've been burned a few times not double-checking certain wiki entries. For example, in my Final Wars video, I made the claim that Kumi Mizuno and Maki Mizuno are related. That's not true, and I had to crudely edit it out of the video using YouTube's edit tool. But regardless, I do find Wikizilla to be a tremendous resource. This can also be said of Toho Kingdom, which was founded in 1999, and there are plenty of other sites and forums that have been useful to documenting Godzilla happenings. 2005's King Kong aside, I'd say the monster movie that got the most attention during this time period would mysteriously appear on the radar during the 2007 summer blockbuster season. It was a certain trailer that was catching people's eye. Looks like you should have left town a little bit earlier. What is it? Is it coming this way? I saw it. It's alive. It's huge. No. Anybody see Jason? Immediately, I thought, this is a Godzilla movie, and as often happens, I was wrong. Cloverfield, a found footage style monster movie taking place right in the middle of Manhattan. The movie was released in January 2008 and was directed by Matt Reeves. The idea for the movie first came about from producer J.J. Abrams. Now, because I'm going to be talking about more contemporary movies and a lot of these directors and actors are still actively working, I'm not going to go into their history like I did with the cast of the older Godzilla movies, as most people already know who guys like J.J. Abrams are. I will mention projects that these more contemporary people worked on if I feel there's a historical or creative reason to or there's some anecdotal point I want to make. But yes, J.J. thought up the idea of Cloverfield, or at least got the idea for a monster movie while visiting a toy store in Japan. He was in Japan promoting Mission Impossible 3. Oh my god. Hey, how you doing? Uh, This is going to be really, really quick. Uh, I just want to say, uh, I want a monster movie. Uh, I want a great monster movie. I've wanted a monster movie for so long, and uh, I was in Japan. Uh, over a year ago with my son, who's eight, and uh, all he wanted to do was go to toy stores, so I know he's my son, and um, we went to uh, all these stores, and there were still all these Godzillas everywhere, and I thought, what's, what's better than Godzilla? And I thought, you know, uh, we need our own monster. Like, we need a monster movie. And I thought, not like King Kong, I love King Kong. And King Kong's adorable. And, um, and Godzilla is, is, you know, a charming uh, monster. We love Godzilla, but I wanted something that was 
uh, it just insane. I can't talk about this movie without discussing the lead up to it. The internet was obsessed with trying to figure out what the monster would look like. I don't remember if the monster appeared in any of the trailers or if there was a merchandise line that blew the whole surprise, but I know I personally didn't see the monster until I was watching the movie. Typically, when I think of hiding the monster, or the concept of it, I think of what Ishiro Honda did in the first Godzilla, and I know many people think of Jaws as well, which took inspiration from Godzilla. It's not entirely the same thing though, as during the lead up to Godzilla in 1954, there were promotional activities and materials where the monster was visible. Cloverfield was different in that respect. At the time, there were little to no details about Cloverfield anywhere. So it was easy for me to think, oh, maybe this is a Godzilla movie. Some folks had theories about it being some other franchise. Now, for the movie itself, I was entertained. This was a time in my life when I still enjoyed going to New York City. I went to school there, I worked there, and I lived there. So I did like seeing some familiar locales while watching. The found footage style was a little controversial in that it bothered some people and made the movie hard to watch. It didn't bother me, though I'll say I prefer monster movies that offer that more procedural approach, where we're a fly on the wall as the government and scientists are trying to stop whatever the calamity is. In Cloverfield, we have no idea what's going on, as we're just in the shoes of the general public. The monster's personality reminded me of the 1998 Godzilla in that I'm not really a fan of a scared or animalistic giant monster. A lot of people like that concept, just a colossal animal walking around that's destroying things by happenstance. I find it to be somewhat boring. We already have large animals in our world. Go to a zoo or an aquarium if you want to see that. Well, regardless of what I think, the team that made the movie wanted to create a monster that was suffering from separation anxiety. Quote, there's nothing scarier than something huge that's spooked. End quote. Cloverfield whetted my appetite for giant monster movies, but at that point in my life I was in college and I hadn't even watched a Godzilla movie in a long time. But then, James Rolfe of Cinemassacre, you may know him as the Angry Video Game Nerd, uploaded a series of videos called the Godzilla-thon as part of his monster madness tradition. These short but highly entertaining summaries of all the Godzilla movies up to that point scratched that nostalgia itch and reminded me of how much time I spent during my childhood watching most of those movies. James's Godzilla-thon is historically relevant to the history of these movies because reviewing Godzilla movies is almost like a rite of passage now for every YouTuber. Everybody has to do it. Everybody has to review at least one Godzilla movie at some point. Whether it was the Godzilla-thon or Angry Video Game Nerd, Cinemassacre inspired an entire generation of content creators, myself included. Sure, if we go back and watch the Godzilla-thon now, James gets some historical facts wrong. I mean, I research the hell out of these videos and I still end up getting stuff wrong, but I always got the feeling that James was just kind of going off the top of his head and enjoying himself, which is impressive in its own right. Anyway, James's video is also where I learned about Godzilla Final Wars. I couldn't believe they were done making Godzilla movies. This really bummed me out at the time. I also recall searching on YouTube for any new Godzilla stuff that might hint at him coming back soon. All I could find was the monster's brief appearance in the 2007 movie Always, Sunset on 3rd Street 2, directed by Takashi Yamazaki. According to an old article from Sci-Fi Japan, the Godzilla shown here was designed using a small model kit that Shunsuke Niwa had in his garage. Yamazaki gave this Godzilla the nickname Third Street Godzilla, who would have known all the way back in 2007 that Takashi Yamazaki would eventually go on to direct easily the most widely praised Godzilla movie in my lifetime, Godzilla Minus One. And by most widely praised, I mean amongst mainstream critics as well. Back in 2008, I was disappointed to see nothing was happening on the Godzilla front. Or so I thought. Little did I know at the time, Godzilla was on his way back. Bono was still at work trying to get his 3D movie made. Along the way, different backers and creative specialists would enter the picture. Like Kerner Optical, producers Brian Rogers and Kenji Okuhira, cinematographer Peter Anderson, and director Keith Melton. 
Perbano, his Hollywood contacts would ask him to see if he could get the rights to Godzilla for a feature-length film of up to two hours. So he went back to Toho to negotiate, but then money became an issue. A bunch of meetings later, this would all lead to an agreement where Bono would return the Godzilla rights to Toho, who would then work out a deal with Legendary Pictures. Under this deal, both Bono and Okuhira would be named executive producers for the new movie, and Legendary had their Godzilla movie rights secured. The plan was now to have this feature-length film announced in 2010 with a projected release date of 2012. Warner Brother Pictures would distribute the film worldwide, while Toho would be distributing it in Japan, with 3D showings being an option. Bono would rework the Godzilla 3D idea into an IMAX Gamera movie idea titled Gamera 3D. As I mentioned in a previous video, Bono would still try to get a new Hedera movie made. It would be called Hedera vs. Midora. According to John LeMay, the idea for the movie would revolve around a new Hedera being created from the Fukushima nuclear incident. Unfortunately, he would not get the chance, as Bono would pass away in 2017. This rebooted Godzilla would officially be revealed at 2010's Comic-Con, with Gareth Edwards announced as the director. Legendary was impressed with Edwards' 2010 movie Monsters. The movie only had a $500,000 budget, but still managed to make a few million dollars at the box office and got positive reviews. The thinking was rather straightforward. If this guy could make a well-liked sci-fi movie with a relatively small budget, imagine what he could do with a big-time Hollywood budget. I watch Monsters for the first time recently, and I see why people like it. One thing to note is that the monsters mostly take up the background while the film focuses more on the two main characters. For the few moments the monsters are the focal point, the movie delivers an entertaining and visually impressive spectacle, considering the budget. And as we'll see, this is sort of a little foreshadowing as to what we would get with Edward's Godzilla. So we had a competent director here. The real question was, did Edwards know Godzilla? To a lot of Godzilla fans, this question mattered a lot. And we got our answer. Quote, the problem is, in the UK, we all grew up with this Hanna-Barbera cartoon with Godzilla and Godzuki, which isn't the most impressive first exposure. But then late every Friday on TV, they started showing these creature features, the Toho movies from the 60s and 70s. I was a massive, massive fan. I just devoured anything sci-fi, especially things from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. On Friday night, they started showing Godzilla. I thought I'd hit my limit of all the movies you could ever get from that genre. Then suddenly I realized there's this whole new world of Japanese sci-fi and fantasy. Godzilla wasn't something that my friends were into. I didn't really tell my mates that I stayed up late on a Friday and watched a Godzilla movie and recorded it. It's the kind of thing you keep to yourself when you're at school. But it's quite funny now how all these same friends are so super excited that I'm getting to make this film. End quote. That was one of those quotes I remember reading and thinking, wow, this guy's one of us. Edwards recalled when his agent told him he got the offer to direct Godzilla, his initial response, holy fuck. He even mentioned that he had the 1954 re-release sitting on his shelf right in front of him when he was on the phone. It was meant to be. At the 2010 Comic-Con, those attending the legendary event would receive a t-shirt with a new Godzilla design on it, created by artist Gonzalo Ordonez Arias. Just like last time, Toho would have their conditions and their input that Legendary had to work with. One of the things Toho wanted was that Godzilla be born, or in this case, somehow entwined with a nuclear accident. And they wanted Japan featured in the movie. Over the next two years, more details started to come out. It was 2012's Comic-Con in San Diego that gave us the poster for the movie, and, more importantly, the teaser trailer, during a panel that included director Edwards. I can't play the entire teaser, or YouTube will give me a smack, but of course you can just go watch it online somewhere. But the teaser gave off a very dark vibe, with different shots of catastrophic scenes with Robert Oppenheimer speaking in the background. We even catch a glimpse of what appears to be a dead monster. Vishnu takes on multi-armed form. But it's the end that awakened years of dormant Godzilla energy. <laughs> that little snippet of Godzilla roaring had me so pumped up at the time. It still gives me goosebumps. We see this giant centipede-like creature in the teaser, 
and it seemed like it was solely made to work with the Oppenheimer quote in the background. According to screenwriter Max Bornstein, the centipede was only created for the teaser, and it was there for the audience to know Godzilla would be fighting a monster or monsters. Per Bornstein, he hadn't even completed the script yet when the teaser came out. Thomas Tull, the founder of Legendary and one of the producers on this movie, would say, quote, our plans are to produce the Godzilla that we, as fans, would want to see. We intend to do justice to those essential elements that have allowed this character to remain as pop-culturally relevant for as long as it has, end quote. I've been a lifelong Godzilla fan from when I saw the 54 version when I was a kid. And, you know, this is, this is a worldwide iconic, you know, monster that everybody knows and, um, we wanted to put a slightly different angle on it and give this generation of fans something something to see. And look, I understand a lot of people's first Godzilla movie was that 1998 one, especially people in my age group. Not everyone who was a kid in 1998 watched the Showa era and Heisei era films. TriStar's Godzilla was their first experience with this IP, and that's fine. You're entitled to think it's a good movie or be sentimental about it, and the fact is, it may not have been considered a success by some measures, but it created new Godzilla fans in the United States. That being said, myself and a lot of other Godzilla fans whose first exposure to the monster was of the Toho variety, we were left disappointed, and the whole thing seemed like a missed opportunity. I've seen some comments saying the hate for that movie is over the top or tired at this point. The reality is, though, with the exception of the first 30 minutes of that movie, I did not like it. So, in the build-up to this 2014 movie, I was hoping Godzilla, the Godzilla I grew up with, would make its first appearance in America. So I was excited, but also a little cautious because of what happened last time. This seemed to be something that Legendary and director Edwards had on their minds as well. Quote, I think he's such an iconic character that he needs to be done justice. There's a lot of closeted Godzilla fans out there. Every day, someone comes up to me and taps me and says, how's it going? Then in an instant, they whisper in my ear, I've always loved Godzilla. I'm a real big fan. Don't fuck it up. They made it a point to reassure Godzilla fans that this would be a more traditional Godzilla. But of course, they needed to tell their own story as well. For writing the story, they brought in David Callahan. Callahan would take about three months to write the first draft, with most of the time spent on the first two acts. The last act, he said, he wrote in about a week. In writing the first story draft, Callahan researched monster movie history and watched many documentaries about disasters and how governments handle them. Quote, On Godzilla, I read about the history of Godzilla, Godzilla's history through film. But I also read a 600-page manual that is handed out to municipal areas, cities, counties, states about disaster preparedness and how to react when a disaster does hit and how to make sure that you rebound from it. Because I was trying to tell the story from a perspective of Godzilla being treated as a disaster. End quote. Over the next few years, multiple people were brought in to write the script and screenplay. David S. Goyer, who wrote the stories for the Batman Dark Knight trilogy, Drew Pierce, writer of Iron Man 3, Frank Darabont, who was the writer and director of The Shawshank Redemption and The Walking Dead, and finally, who I mentioned earlier, Max Borenstein. Borenstein would get the final credit as writing the screenplay. Darabont would say their Godzilla would not be tied to the atomic bomb test, but a different contemporary issue. This Godzilla would be a, quote, terrifying force of nature, end quote. Filming began on Vancouver Island in March of 2013 under the fake working title Nautilus. During a watch-along of the movie on Twitter in 2020, Edwards tweeted that he originally codenamed it Fat Man after one of the bombs dropped during World War II. Though the tweet does mix up where Fat Man was dropped, that bomb was dropped on Nagasaki, where Little Boy was dropped on Hiroshima. Anyway, further filming would take place in Hawaii for a few months. The last day of filming would be on July 18th, 2013. I'll admit here, I may have made many videos about the history of Godzilla and other stuff related to movies, but when it comes to the technical aspect of filming, I know nothing of the ins and outs of how this stuff works. So the following factoid I'm about to talk about 
comes from the American Cinematographer website. This is the first Godzilla movie filmed in anamorphic widescreen since Terra of Mechagodzilla. Seamus McGarvey, the film's director of photography, would use customized Panavision C-series anamorphic lenses and Panavision anamorphic zooms on Ari Alexa Studio 4x3 digital cameras. Again, if you know what all that means, God bless you, but I don't. At a promotional appearance, Gareth Edwards would describe the tone of the film. Quote, We're just going to take it really seriously. I've wanted to see this movie this way all my life. Imagine if this really happened, as crazy as it sounds. What would it really be like? End quote. Back in 1954, that's basically what Honda did. He got the whole staff together and said, We're treating this seriously. You're either in or you're out. In 2013, Legendary began casting parts for the movie. Some notable talents were rumored to be in the mix. Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Henry Cavill, Scoot McNary, Caleb Landry-Jones, none of which would end up in the movie. The summer before Godzilla came out, us kaiju fans were treated to a movie called Pacific Rim, directed by Guillermo del Toro. The film centers around humanity in the future, using giant mechas to fight giant monsters coming from an interdimensional portal under the ocean. If you love anime, mecha, or kaiju, this movie is for you. And in a lot of ways, these Japanese-inspired movies were becoming more prevalent in the U.S. at the time. But this seemed to come out of nowhere, at least from my perspective. I was busy waiting for Godzilla, and then here we go. We get this crazy movie that, in a way, served as a warm-up. It was also an excellent test to see how American audiences would react to a good old giant monster mash. The idea for the movie came about when writer Travis Beecham was walking along the beach by the Santa Monica Pier when he envisioned a giant robot fighting a giant monster. Quote, They just sort of materialized out of the fog, these vast, godlike things. End quote. Del Toro wanted the movie to be lighthearted, colorful, and capture a new generation of kids' imagination. He wanted something new, but also something that paid respect to the originals. Quote, Conscious of the heritage, but not a pastiche or homage or a greatest hits of everything. End quote. While designing the Jaegers, the mechas of the movie, and Kaiju, they would do a weekly American Idol-like judging of all the designs. You hear this expression a lot, but the movie really is a love letter to giant monster movie fans. And it established itself as its own thing, rather than just being a tribute. The movie's ending credits put in a classy dedication to Ray Harryhausen and Ishiro Honda. Quote, I want the joy that I used to get seeing Godzilla toss a tank without having to think there are guys in the tank. In my case, I'm picking up a tradition. One that started right after World War II and was a coping mechanism, in a way, for Japan to heal the wounds of that war. I'd say the movie also made the word kaiju more commonly known in the West, as it's used a lot in the movie. Though I've had a few people snipe at me for using the phrase kaiju ega when talking about the Showa era movies, claiming that nobody called Godzilla movies kaiju ega until Pacific Rim came out. It's worth noting that in a lot of the works about the older movies, the phrase Kaiju Ega is used, and some of these books were published in the 1990s. So no, Pacific Rim did not invent the term Kaiju. Anyway, Pacific Rim would do better overseas than in the United States, and was overall a financial success. But either way, this was sort of a nice trial run for Legendary before the Godzilla debut. It gave me a sense of relief knowing that Legendary knew what they were doing. If Del Toro's movie was airy and lighthearted, Edward's Godzilla was anything but that if we were to just go off the first full trailer that was released online on December 10th, 2013. And just like with the teaser, I can't play it, but it is a beautifully cut and intense trailer that gives off a dark ambiance and it almost makes you think it's for a war or disaster film, not a Godzilla movie. More trailers would of course drop showing different shots from the movie that would start some fun rumors. One of which was that the Shobijin were spotted, meaning, of course, Mothra would be somehow making a surprise appearance. This rumor would pick up so much steam that Edwards himself caught wind of it and found the whole thing 
to be quite amusing. Legendary would have an advertising budget of $100 million, and they would rely on a new applied analytics group, which a lot of sports teams use, to oversee the marketing efforts. This would make Godzilla the first movie to use this type of analytical marketing. There was, of course, a viral campaign. In July of 2013, Legendary launched the website GodzillaEncounter.com, and they would convert a warehouse in San Diego into the Godzilla Encounter exhibit. The exhibit would have historical Godzilla props from older movies, actors playing rescue workers and patrons, and a visual ride where at the top floor of the building you would see Godzilla walking past the window. Barnaby Legg headed up the creation of the exhibit, and in an interview with Toho Kingdom, he would say that it took three months to complete. And the cast of the movie would even visit the Encounter exhibit. I was, I was scared. <laughs> Other websites like MutoResearch.net would be put up. There would also be a GodzillaAlert.com where fans were encouraged to create their own video of them seeing Godzilla and freaking out. To imagine what it'd be like if Godzilla showed up in your hometown. Your footage can be in any form you like, live action, animation, stop motion. Good luck, and we can't wait to see what you come up with. A lot of time has passed since this competition. I just decided to type in Godzilla Alert into YouTube and I found this gem. That's actually pretty damn good. I have no idea who the winners were, but apparently they would take each video and make them into one big mashup. I'm kind of jealous I didn't know about it at the time. As for the TV campaign, the Godzilla Snickers commercial was perhaps my favorite. How do you do yeah, it? Yeah. Oh, oh. Godzilla's actually pretty cool. That's when he's hungry. Snickers. You're not you when you're hungry. Snickers satisfies. See the new Godzilla in theaters May 16th. The car company Fiat also had a good one where Godzilla chokes on a car. And you really get a good look at the Godzilla design in action. I remember I saw this commercial come on when I was watching something with my dad and he was like, Hey, it's like those old movies you used to watch. And for a moment, I was getting those feelings again that I had as a kid, where I was oddly proud that my guy Godzilla was getting pushed to the U.S. mainstream again, just like back in 1998. More teasers and trailers would be released in the run-up to the movie, revealing more of the film locations and other creatures that would appear. As for the merchandise, no shock here, Bandai America would be the toy partner. In passing, when I saw some of the merchandise, I thought they looked like undetailed blocks of shit, but I doubt any kids care about the details. Legendary would write a graphic novel that came out in the U.S. a little over a week before the movie's release date, Godzilla Awakening, written by the movie's screenwriter Max Borenstein. Legendary would release more over the years, and at multiple points they would imply that they're considered canon to the movies, but ultimately it's unclear, at least as of the making of this video. This murkiness is due to what appear to be possible continuity errors between the movies, novels, and other works. I'll talk about this more a little later. For now, how about I finally get to the movie itself? How about that? How about that? How about that? Who started it? The movie begins with a dramatic opening credit sequence, and we see some mystical-looking creatures. Some of the images are taken from the book The Phantom Atlas, The Greatest Myths, Lies, and Blunders on Maps, written by Edward Brooke Hitching. The book goes into the history of antique maps and the interesting things in them. The first creatures we see are pictographs of what's called the, and I'm probably going to mispronounce this, I think you all know that, but here we go anyway. The creature is called the Mishibizu, and there are also two serpents underneath it. The main creature was supposed to be an underwater panther of sorts in the mythological traditions of some indigenous North American tribes. A ichthyosaurus fossil is shown and a mosasaurus. And then we get the origin of species by Charles Darwin. 
A series of different sea monsters from Roman antiquity and Greek mythology are also shown. We then shift to pictures of government documents, one about the sinking of the USS Maine in 1898. Ah, so I see Godzilla started the Spanish-American War. While these images are flashing on screen, the credits have these sentences under them that get quickly redacted. Warner Brothers Pictures and Legendary Pictures present a terrifying tale of disaster and woe. I don't think these are supposed to be read that way, but I had a laugh reading them. I'm not going to go through all of them, but this credit sequence is quite the production with all these eerie little tidbits. Another good one, are these animals real? Can we prove they exist? Or are they merely men in rubber suits with costumes designed by tricksters? A nice nod to the Toksatsu roots. We see black and white footage of Godzilla's dorsal fins rising above the water. Basically, the opening sequence tells an alternate history of the 1954 Castle Bravo test, where the U.S. military and the organization Monarch detonate a hydrogen bomb at the Bikini Atoll. However, it is not a test. Castle Bravo is just a cover. Their real mission is to use the bomb to kill a monster named Godzilla. In the Blu-ray special features, they include a video called Operation Lucky Dragon, a reference to the real-life Lucky Dragon No. 5 incident. So in this movie's universe, I believe Castle Bravo is the cover name for what is actually Operation Lucky Dragon. Yeah, just uh, reference overload there. So already the movie establishes that Godzilla was not created by atomic weapons and was already a known entity that the U.S. government was aware of and fearful of. Edwards didn't think it was feasible for something like Godzilla to go unseen by humans. The U.S. government secretly knowing seemed more plausible. In an earlier draft, Godzilla was going to be found frozen in ice, but this was canned due to 2013's Man of Steel doing something similar. This also establishes early on that the existential danger of atomic weapons is not the theme here, and that not even humanity's most powerful weapons can stop nature itself. Remember, the history of this movie began with Yoshimitsu Bono. Edward seemingly took to Bono's feelings about Godzilla and nature, with Godzilla serving a role as ecological defender of sorts. In fact, once Legendary got the rights, Bono was concerned the environmental theme would be eliminated, and so he asked Edwards to keep it in. He would visit the Hawaii set for a few days where the team gave Bono the entire script to read. Bono would say he was extremely happy that they kept the theme in. Though Edwards still made sure to mention the original and its influence. Quote, Godzilla is a metaphor for Hiroshima in the original movie. We tried to keep that, and there are a lot of themes from the 54 movie that we've kept. I think my favorite visual, besides Godzilla coming out of the water, he looks absolutely massive here, is the bomb with the crude Godzilla drawing on it. The infamous Baker shot from Operation Crossroads is used, and we've seen these before. The 1998 movie used it as well. The reason you've probably seen these clips before in other movies or works is because most atomic detonations are not so clearly seen because the flashing light. However, with the Baker test, that bright light part of the process took place underwater, so we get a much clearer shot. You also have the ships present, which gives it scale. I think it's good that they show personnel and inhabitants of the islands near the Bikini Atoll. Even though this is an alternate telling of the Castle Bravo test, in reality, this test spread radioactive fallout to nearby islands, impacting the inhabitants. The foods that the islanders ate were contaminated, which led to people getting sick. In total, 15 islands and atolls were affected. The U.S. would pay out millions of dollars to those harmed. I'm not going to lie, I had a dumb question while I was making this video. I was curious if the footage they use here showing the inhabitants was real archive footage, or was it just one of the shots that they created with the team? It turns out it is archive footage. Those are the real children of the Bikini Atoll. For the parts that weren't archive footage, cinematographer Seamus McGarvey shot them using vintage lenses from the 1960s. Despite the secret nature of Castle Bravo, it became an international incident, as traces of fallout spread to other countries, even parts of the U.S. And as us Godzilla fans know, it was the incident involving the Japanese fishing vessel Daigo Fukuru Maru, or Lucky Dragon No. 5, 
that caused uproar in Japan and would be the main source of inspiration for Tomiyuki Tanaka when coming up with the idea for Godzilla. See my video on the 1954 Godzilla for more on that. The U.S. Navy and U.S. Army would participate in the making of Godzilla 2014, and this opening sequence was partly filmed on the USS Missouri at Pearl Harbor. The U.S. Marine Corps, which did help with the 1998 movie, declined to be involved in this one. Perhaps because Roland Emmerich made them look like incompetent jackasses. Fire at will. Fire, 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 fire! You've caused more damage than that goddamn thing did! Edwards would speak with FEMA and Department of Defense officials to get their perspective on disaster situations. Quote, the Department of Defense was also cooperating on the film, so they gave us a lot of advice about what they would do. I think they're all out and out Godzilla fans. You have to wonder, what does the military get out of helping people make movies? The answer is marketing. Quote, our hope is, the demographics for this audience are roughly 14 to 18 year old teenagers who are watching movies. They are going to take their family to this film and they're going to walk out of the theater and say, you know... I never knew the Navy was such a sophisticated professional organization. Maybe it's something I want to do with my life. End quote. The credits end with a CG shot, and then we get the title amongst what looks like nuclear fallout. Famous designer Kyle Cooper was the man behind the opening credits, and this is not the first time we're talking about him. He also did the credits for Godzilla Final Wars in 2004. And Cooper's opening credit sequence for this Godzilla in 2014 is tremendous. It gets you pumped up and the music sets the tone perfectly. Speaking of the music, the score for the film was composed by Alexander Michel Gerard Desplat. He would take about two months from January to February to create it. During the Godzilla premiere in London, HeyYouGuys.com asked Depla if he took any cues from previous Godzilla movies when creating the score. When you're composing the music for something like this, are you taking cues from previous Godzilla films? Of course not. No, why would I? I have to create something new. He also said that he'd only ever seen the first Godzilla, and obviously this one. But that doesn't mean he didn't take some inspiration. Back in Japan, to celebrate Godzilla's 60th anniversary, NHK would release a documentary about Akira Ifakube, the man who painted monsters with sound, Godzilla vs. Akira Ifakube. Depla would appear in the documentary and explain that he valued rhythm over melody when doing his Godzilla score, and this may have been influenced by Ifakube himself. After the credits, we fast forward in time to 1999 in the Philippines. We see Dr. Ishiro Serizawa and Dr. Vivian Graham researching a mining collapse and the skeletal remains of a large creature. Ishiro Serizawa is played by Ken Watanabe. Watanabe, a Gamera fan growing up, started his career right out of high school, moving to Tokyo when he graduated, enrolling in a drama school and joining a troupe. His film debut in Japan was 1984's MacArthur's Children, a movie about folks in a rural community in Japan during the U.S. occupation after the war. In Japan, he gained a reputation for playing samurai. Watanabe's U.S. film debut was in The Last Samurai with Tom Cruise. Watanabe would do his lines again in Japanese for the Japanese dub of Godzilla. One tie-in that he had to the Godzilla series before this movie was that his second ex-wife, Kaho Minami, played Colonel Kumi Amori in GMK back in 2001. Quote, If you are telling the Godzilla story, you cannot separate it from the nuclear element. And the first thing I asked was whether there was going to be the nuclear element, as that now, in Japan, is a really sensitive problem. I was worried about how I could use that and how I could make that okay, but Gareth understood those feelings. The name of his character in this movie is chock full of references you'll all know. Dr. Ishiro Serizawa, Ishiro after Ishiro Honda, the first Godzilla director, and Serizawa after Dr. Serizawa from the first Godzilla. In an earlier draft, he was going to be named Dr. Honda. One more little thing, Serizawa's outfit in this first scene is a reference to Eiji Tsuburaya's usual attire at work. Serizawa's assistant Vivian is played by Sally Hawkins. The English-born Hawkins is pretty famous, so I won't say too much. She's been in a few Woody Allen movies and has won multiple awards in her career, and I'm sure there's more to come. 
what, what is the meaning about the uh, Godzilla remake? Then I discussed to the Gareth, and uh, he has a great vision and a great knowledge about uh, uh, what is the meaning about Godzilla. You know, we have uh, same, same fear about uh, destroy the nuclear plant by the tsunami. Then, even after 60 years, we have the same fear, have not changed. Yeah, we need to say something involved the theme about in yeah this this movie yeah now before getting into the lore of this movie's universe i do need to preface that of the year i'm making this video 2024 this is an ongoing cinematic universe so some of the things i'm about to say may in the future be retconned or removed from said cinematic universe that being said i'm not as concerned with the in-universe history as i am with the history of how the movie came to be anyway moving on Sarazawa and Vivian are from an organization known as Monarch. Monarch is basically a monster tracking organization, though it's a little more complicated than that. According to some of the lore, it was founded as a joint Japanese and American task force, founded in 1946 by President Harry Truman to investigate the sinking of the USS Lawton. In this movie, it's stated that it was founded in 1954, but that gets contradicted in other media. Monarch would become an international organization and help with the hydrogen bomb attack on Godzilla shown in the credit sequence. Monarch's logo was designed by that opening credit genius, Cooper. He was told to make it look like an M, but also a warning sign slash butterfly. He basically combined all three things. In one of the earlier drafts, Monarch was going to be a UN-based organization called the Special Muto Unit. Down in the collapsed mine, Sarazawa and Vivian find a gigantic skeleton. Vivian asks Sarazawa if it's him, <coughs> Godzilla, <coughs> but he says no, and that this skeleton belongs to something much older. They then discover two giant spores, or eggs, inside the skeleton. One spore is unhatched and eventually is transported to Nevada. The other one already hatched, and we see its destructive trail to the ocean. What the hell is going on here? If that's not Godzilla, then what is it? And why did it have giant egg sacs inside its body? As Sarazawa said, it was something much older than him, aka Godzilla. So if we just take that and one of the pictures in the Monarch slideshow that we see later, we are to believe this is a member of the Godzilla species, codenamed Adam by Monarch. That doesn't answer why the spores are in the skeleton and raises a few other questions. Well, we would get a more exact answer to those questions five years later in 2019 in the form of another graphic novel, Godzilla Aftershock published by Legendary Comics. Both Godzilla Awakening, which I already mentioned, and Godzilla Aftershock serve as prequels to their subsequent movies and sort of fill in the blanks on questions that the movies don't provide full answers on. First, a little about Godzilla Awakening. In the graphic novel, we learn from Serizawa's dad, Eiji, about the existence of a large crocodile-like creature named Kojira and a flying monster that Eiji named Shinomura. It's explained here that Monarch was formed to kill these massive, unidentified terrestrial organisms, or MUTOs, in secrecy in order to avoid worldwide chaos. In the graphic novel, it's mentioned that Shinomura awakened in 1945 due to the atomic bombing of Hiroshima, and it was its reawakening that caused Godzilla to start appearing. In order to stop Shinomura and Godzilla, General Douglas MacArthur conducts the Castle Bravo test, aka the attempt to kill both monsters with a hydrogen bomb. In contrast, the movie never mentions anything about Shinomura being present during the attack. Additionally, the 2023 TV show Monarch Legacy of Monsters also depicts the Castle Bravo event, and there is no mention of Shinomura in that depiction either. The fake test presumably kills Shinomura. As for Godzilla, Sarazawa's dad tells a young Ishiro that he believes Godzilla survived, which of course he did. The young Sarazawa then joins Monarch after his father dies. So really the graphic novel gives you a better sense than the movie does as to why Sarazawa in the movie, as we'll see, is oddly sentimental about Godzilla. Okay, that's nice, but what about the giant skeleton that we see in this scene? Well, let's move over to the other graphic novel, Godzilla Aftershock. We find out that the skeleton was from a creature named Dagon, or named Raijin by the Japanese. 
The name Dagon is used in a lot of other places as well. It's in the Bible where Dagon is a god associated with the Philistines. And the name is the title of one of H.P. Lovecraft's first short stories, a story narrated by a tortured soul at sea. The name Raijin comes from the god of lightning, thunder, and storms in Japanese mythology. A humorous story I tell people is when I got to see a beautiful depiction of the Raijin and Fujin, the god of wind, on my visit to Kyoto. But sadly, and I found rather humorously, I had to leave early due to a storm. Not a storm outside, a storm in my stomach. The girlfriend didn't find it as humorous. It is confirmed in the novel that Dagon was a member of the Godzilla species. It's explained that Dagon once fought a creature named Jinshin Mushi, or Muto Prime, back in the 11th century BC and lost. Even worse for Dagon, he was infected with Muto Prime's parasitic young. Dagon would eventually die, and thousands of years later, perhaps due to contact with the outside air, the Mutos started to catalyze. If you've watched my videos before, you know I generally don't like spending this much time talking about the supplementary material or third-party material. I usually wait until the end of the video to quickly mention graphic novels and whatnot. But movies nowadays sometimes rely on those things at worst to fill in the gaps in the writing and at best to simply expand the universe. That being said, Godzilla has had comic or manga adaptations for a long time, going all the way back to the first movie. They even had a radio drama air before the 1954 film came out. The difference is, is that those materials mostly didn't tie into the plot of the movie or series, and were usually just a retelling of the movie with minor differences. But as I cover these more modern Godzilla movies, it's just unavoidable. I have to talk about them. In recent times, I've even seen a few instances of movies' plots being impacted by events in video games. At the risk of sounding like an angry old man, I just miss going into a movie and not having to do homework beforehand or afterward to fully understand the story. After seeing that one of the parasites has traveled outside the skeleton and into the sea, a few days pass and the movie moves to Japan, where we are introduced to the Brodies in the fictional Japanese city of Janjira, which has a nuclear power plant located in it. And isn't it funny how one of the first things we see is a ground-level shot with feet walking and military toys in the foreground, a nod to the land where Suitmation was immortalized and some light foreshadowing, perhaps. There's also an Easter egg we see seconds later, a poster resembling something out of the Showa-era Godzilla movies. The two monsters, one of which is named Habura, resemble the Mutos, which we'll see later in the movie. And some of the film's cast is listed below in Japanese. We have Joe Brody, played by Brian Cranston, his wife Sandra Brody, played by Juliette Binoche, and finally we have young Ford Brody, played by C.J. Adams, and later he is played by Aaron Taylor Johnson. Binoche said she agreed to be part of the movie after reading a beautiful letter from Edwards and because she wanted to make her son happy, who was a Godzilla fan. When Taylor Johnson met Edwards, they talked for six hours about the character, and Taylor Johnson praised Edwards for treating this like a, quote, big-budget art film, end quote. According to Edwards, it was the rewrite by Darabont for a specific scene that got Brian Cranston to join the project. He initially was going to decline because he thought the concept was silly. However, Edwards impressed Cranston and got him to read the script. Cranston says he grew up loving Godzilla because Godzilla didn't apologize for anything, and that was so quote-unquote boy of him. He then proceeded to motion his arms like he was crushing something. The Brody name was chosen as a reference to Chief Martin Brody from Jaws. So now the reference circle is complete. Jaws was inspired by Godzilla, and now we have Godzilla tipping the hat back to Jaws. The name Ford was picked because the writers wanted the character to evoke a Harrison Ford-like feel. Brian Cranston's back must have been killing him after this movie because he carries the first 30 minutes. Cranston is mostly known for starring in what is considered one of the greatest TV shows of all time, Breaking Bad. I'm more of a Sopranos guy, but that's okay. Growing up, I always associated him with his role as Hal in Malcolm in the Middle. And they did put a humorous Easter egg in the credits honoring both characters, Walter White and Hal. And I never knew this, but Cranston also did voiceover work in the first season of the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Oh, get away with this! Oh. Goodbye, Power Rangers! 
Due to him just having a great sense of humor, Cranston would come up with a fake feud between him and Godzilla. Are we supposed to be able to talk about that? Or, uh, I just... Um, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll just be honest with you. I, I don't like him. You know, I, I didn't care for him at all. I thought he was a jerk. Due to Breaking Bad just ending in 2013, Cranston still had the Walter White look going and had to wear a wig for his role in Godzilla. Even Cranston, amongst others, managed to take a crack at the 1998 Godzilla. Quote, We think you'll be able to wipe the memory of the old Godzilla 12 years ago, or whatever that was, completely out of your system. This Godzilla is very different. Joe is extremely concerned about seismic activity that's been working its way to Japan, so much so that he forgets that it's his birthday, despite his son making him a sign that he doesn't see, and his wife mentioning it in the car a couple of times. Once at the plant, he's told that the activity has increased. Conversing with Joe is fellow plant worker Stan, played by Gary Chalk. He's best known for voicing Optimus Primal. No need to worry, Joe. Optimus Primal is here. Sandra leads a team to the bowels of the plant to check for damage and confirms that there's been a reactor breach and radiation leak. Joe knows she needs to run for her life if she's going to make it out alive. Unfortunately, Sandra's team does not make it to the safety door in time, and Joe Brody, in order to save the whole city from exposure, has to seal his own wife to a grim fate. What a scream by Cranston here. Haunting. Heartbreaking. Per Binoche, Quentin Tarantino cried during this scene. He would say this was, quote, the first time I've ever cried during a 3D blockbuster, end quote. Outside, a young Ford Brody sees the cooling towers of the plant he knows his parents work at collapse. The destruction in the background of the once tranquil, beautiful school grounds is oddly captivating. I'm not going to go too crazy with the Easter eggs or possible references, but in this part you will notice the class is learning about the life cycle of a moth or a butterfly. The one on the wall has Mothra's color palette. You'll also notice some stuff by the window that are light references at most. Notable, the power plants had those iconic cooling towers that I'm sure a lot of people associate with nuclear power plants mostly from The Simpsons, probably. Interestingly, Japanese power plants don't have those, a feature that could be nitpicked by a Japanese viewer. I tried my best to understand why Japan's plants don't have them. The best layman explanation I could understand was that Japan's plants don't need cooling towers because their systems essentially use the ocean to do that. If I got that wrong at a high level, let me know in the comments. At the time this movie came out, it was hard to see these images and not think of the Fukushima nuclear incident that occurred only a few years earlier. In March of 2011, the Tohoku earthquake and tsunami occurred. Tragically, thousands would be killed. The earthquake is the largest recorded earthquake in the history of Japan, a magnitude 9.1 on the Richter scale. The ensuing tsunami damaged the Fukushima nuclear reactor, causing three nuclear meltdowns. It would go down as the worst nuclear accident since the Chernobyl disaster of 1986. In an interview with the New York Daily News in 2014, Edward said, As we were writing the film, the horrible events in Fukushima happened and we had to make the decision. Do we stay away from that or do we acknowledge that you've opened this Pandora's box of nuclear power and when it goes wrong, it really does go wrong? A few days later, during another interview, he stated, When you list what makes a Godzilla movie, two of those things that come up are radiation and Japan. And so once the events happened that were horrific for real in Japan, we had to be very careful and sensitive not to do something that would be considered insensitive to what happened there. Our film is not based on anything to do with Fukushima. It's in a fictional city outside of Tokyo and happens 15 years ago. But that said, it does deal with the genuine problem of around the world. We have these nuclear power plants and we benefit from it. From the trailer and teaser, you got the sense that they were going for that 1954 feel, just updated for modern times. Perhaps if Edwards did lean into the Fukushima disaster, like Tanaka leaned into the Lucky Dragon 5 incident, this movie would be seen as another 1954 Godzilla, in that it's hearkening to something real and tragic. Though this is always tricky business, because then you open yourself up to being accused of exploiting tragedy or being insensitive, as Edwards had noted. I was trying to pull from those visuals and the things that have haunted this generation and try to tap into some of that. 
At the end of the day, Godzilla is the manifestation of our nightmares about nature and what it can do when it comes to put us in our place and reminds us we're not the most powerful thing on the planet. It's a literal version of that. All around the office, we all had that horrific imagery up as an inspiration for what some of this could look like. But at the end of the day, it's entertainment. Steve Rifle, whose many Godzilla works I reference in practically all my videos, had this to say about 2014's Godzilla. America is incapable of making an honest Godzilla. Edwards has claimed that his film's disaster pornography, digitally realistic images resembling Fukushima, the Indian Ocean tsunami, Katrina 9-11, contextualizes the story for our dangerous modern world. But his film does not comment on those images or what they might mean, and so they unspool as hollow exercises in technical prowess. Shin Godzilla, which would come out two years later in 2016, certainly made no bones about what it was trying to convey. The allusions to the Fukushima disaster and the mockery of the bureaucratic process are on full display there. And that's a big reason why some Godzilla fans consider Shin Godzilla to be in that same spirit or realm as the original one. Can we say the same about 2014's Godzilla? Probably not. But you know what? It doesn't have to be that type of movie. Edwards had his story to tell, and he told it. Fifteen years have passed since Ford's mother's death, and since my tangent started. And we see Ford now fully grown and in the U.S. Navy as an explosive ordnance disposal officer. He's back from a tour of duty, now in his home of San Francisco, where they celebrate his return. His son Sam Brody, played by Carson Bold, shows Ford the sign he made for his return, mirroring the earlier scene where Ford made a sign for his dad Joe. Playing Ford's wife Elle is Elizabeth Olsen. Not that she didn't have a career before this movie, but it would be 2015's Avengers Age of Ultron and her role as Scarlet Witch that would really make her a household name as she became a staple of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Coincidentally, Taylor Johnson would also be in Age of Ultron playing Quicksilver, who is Scarlet Witch's fraternal twin brother. Their relationship in Godzilla is obviously a little different. Lucky son of a bitch. Funny enough, you'll notice as we go through these movies that a lot of the MCU cast is also part of the MonsterVerse. Olsen is the younger sister of Mary-Kate and Ashley. If you grew up in the 90s, you know who they are. Ford, Elle, and Sam enjoying family time is probably the best acting out of all three in the entire movie. It might be the only time Taylor Johnson shows some damn emotion. I suspect they were told to just sort of improvise and have fun eating cake, because the whole thing almost plays like a behind-the-scenes clip. It's nice. Something funny that author William Tsutsui noticed is that there are, quote, far more overt displays of affection in the first 15 minutes of the 2014 Godzilla than in the entire Japanese franchise, which totaled one very chaste kiss over 50 years. And even that kiss was partly American. Good old Nick Adams and Invasion of Astro Monster. In one earlier draft written in 2012, the main characters were going to be named Ford and Al Maddox, and they were going to be siblings, age 18 and 13 respectively, and Brian Cranston would have been playing a character named Nathan Brody instead of Joe Brody. The reunion is cut short as they learn that good old Joe was arrested in Japan for trying to get back into Janjira, which was quarantined after the disaster. The shot of Tokyo they use is from the Shinjuku Ward, and you see the Don Quixote or Donkey sign up here, and it is a very vital store if you're ever in Japan, but it's right by that store where the Godzilla head is. Yes, the multiple... B footage shots that I use and that I have of this thing is absurd, but it helps with the videos and it's the first, if you want to call it landmark, that I made sure to see the first time I was in Tokyo. I'll talk about the history of this beautiful monument in my next video when we get to Shin Godzilla. Anyway, back in Tokyo, we see Japanese parents getting their son out of police custody. Ford's world is upside down. Conversely, he, the son, is bailing out the father from jail. There is a deleted scene where legendary actor Akira Takarada was going to make a cameo as a customs officer for when Ford arrives in Japan. I couldn't find the deleted scene anywhere other than these shots, but why cut this scene? According to Edwards, it was to help get to the monster action sooner. Quote, From an emotional point of view, in terms of my love of Godzilla, the hardest thing was Akira Takarada, who was in the original films, did a cameo for us on day one. He played an immigrations officer that welcomes Aaron's character to Japan. And so I was like, this is perfect. Day one, first shot. 
There was a lot of pressure to get on with the adventure and get to the monsters as soon as you can. So, lots of things came out of that part of the movie, and I hung on to that scene with Takarada till the last second. And it was still deemed, by the screenings when we tested it, that we had to get it shorter. And so, that ended up having to go, which is probably my biggest regret. End quote. As a Godzilla fan, it's aggravating reading this. It's also understandable. I think Edwards explained it the best he could. I don't know how all this stuff works. I don't know all the ins and outs, but if I was director, I wouldn't have given a shit. That man would have been in the movie. That scene would have been in the movie. Cut five seconds off the the credits or something. Just find a way. We go back to Joe's place and learn he's now rather poor, teaching English despite being a brilliant man with a PhD. We see he has been obsessed with the incident that took his wife 15 years ago, still trying to find the cause. He mentions a thing being in the old remains of the power plant, and that it's talking using echolocation. Cranston's performance is outstanding here. You really get the sense that he has unfinished business in Japan and isn't leaving until it's settled. He wants the truth. Ford even tries playing on Joe being a grandpa to try and get him to come back to the U.S., but in the end, it's Joe that gets Ford to go with him to once again break into the quarantine zone. Another scene that was cut would have showed Ford sleeping at Joe's apartment with an old Toho movie on the screen. When Joe and Ford get to the site, instead of finding a radioactive wasteland, they see life everywhere, overgrown plants, insects, and even some dogs. Joe was right. There is no radiation anymore. There's another reason why they are being kept out of this area. I get the sense that Edwards felt right at home here with monsters having similar scenes. As they begin exploring their old house, there's a little Easter egg here as you see an old tank that has tape along its bottom reading, Dad's Mothra. Where the tape rips, there are two letters R-A from Janjira. Little did we know at the time what was coming five years later. Both dad and son find important pieces of their past, and then Joe finally sees the happy birthday sign his son made him all those years ago. They discover that there is activity going on at the site of the former power plant. However, they soon get arrested. Here we see that it's Monarch that is running the facility monitoring the creature that hatched from the skeleton 15 years ago. Sarazawa is informed about the Brody's arrest, and holy crap, it's Mikey Palmisi. Go take a mitol. I totally didn't catch that Al Sapienza was in this movie the first time I saw it. I also missed that he played the cab driver in 1998 when Godzilla starts running around New York. In the Monarch interrogation room, Joe starts demanding to know where his son is. Cranston's Japanese pronunciation is good, too. Way better than mine, even though that isn't saying much considering what I do to English. As the facility begins to shake and the lights flicker, Joe warns them that this is exactly like years ago, and that an electromagnetic pulse is coming. And it is going to send us back to the Stone Age! I love the line Joe says about sending us back to the Stone Age. This creature's ability to emit EMPs or electromagnetic pulses is specifically dangerous to our society. We rely on electrical grids that are vulnerable to EMPs. Whenever Congress and the U.S. discuss a potential EMP attack on the U.S., they almost always use the phrasing Joe used. It'll send us back to the Stone Age. Imagine all electronic devices that aren't EMP protected just getting fried instantly. Airplanes would fall out of the sky, cars would just stop working. We would be screwed, to say the least. Sarazawa realizes that Joe is right, and he mournfully commands his crew to kill the creature as it is building up to an EMP attack. It appears they zap it with electricity to try and put it down for good, Unfortunately for them, it doesn't work. The monster burst onto the scene with an EMP attack, rendering the facility helpless. It's time to meet the Muto, the male version. The male Muto is a prehistoric parasite, one of the offspring from Muto Prime. It nested inside Dagon thousands of years ago, feasting on its radiation. It wasn't until a mining collapse in the Philippines that the creature awakened and went to Japan to feed off the radiation from the Janjira power plant. This Muto can use echolocation, EMPs, it can absorb radiation, and it can fly. 
Designing the MUTOs was a lengthy process. Before there was a MUTO, designers came up with the concept art for a monster named Rock MUTO. Maybe they were going for rock metal, or I'm just pronouncing that wrong. Pretty similar, though, to our pal Angerus. The plan was to have Godzilla and fake Angerus fight in San Francisco. Which is hilarious, because that would have been the same story idea as the Volcano Monsters, something I talked about uh, back in my Godzilla Raids Again video, but the Volcano Monsters was an unmade American movie idea back in the 1950s, where American editors would have taken footage from Godzilla Raids Again and basically turned it into an entirely new movie based in San Francisco. Legendary also came up with a pterodactyl-like monster design. Perhaps fake Rodan would have teamed up with fake Angerus. Bornstein and Edwards wanted a monster that would be a natural enemy to Godzilla. One of Thomas Tull's stipulations to Edwards was that Godzilla had to fight another monster. It really can't be understated how important Tull was in this process. Having a Godzilla fan as producer as well was a fortunate thing. Tull liked the idea of the Mutos and Godzilla belonging to an ecosystem that connects them in some ancient organic way. One of Edward's first design ideas was for the Muto to resemble a crab-like monster, but most of the designs would be created by artist Matt Alsop, and he would create several dozens of them. Alsop and Edwards would try to take some of the most iconic features of the Tyrannosaurus Rex, the Xenomorphs, the Arachnids from Starship Troopers, Bruce from Jaws, and King Kong. Arthropods, such as beetles and spiders, were an inspiration as well. Jim Regiel, of course, had a say in this process, being in charge of the visual effects. He thought that the Mutos, quote, had to be menacing enough to take on Godzilla, but sort of facile enough to move around the city, yet still be based on some sort of natural look. One of the first designs had the Mutos with almost no features on the face and almost no eyes. Four wings for the Muto were considered, shaped like the X-Wing from Star Wars. Alsop would drop this due to the wings being too much like a dragon. At the time I saw the movie, I do remember being disappointed with the Muto design. It reminded me of an even duller looking Cloverfield monster. Well, regardless of my thoughts, the crew would take over a year to design these creatures. They really did did want to create something new for contemporary audiences. After my recent rewatch, my opinion has changed. I actually do like the Muto design now. Maybe back in 2014, I was thinking too much about the brightly colored kaiju from Pacific Rim, and so the Mutos maybe looked a little dull in comparison. My favorite aspect of the Mutos is the EMP attack. I think it's one of the better ideas in the movie. It makes the military's intervention against the creatures that much more difficult. They would look at mosquitoes and birds for inspiration until finally landing on stealth bombers as a reference for the Mutos. And it was oddly appropriate as both stealth bombers and as we'd see, Mutos carry nukes. According to John LeMay, King Ghidorah was originally in consideration for being the main villain here, but Edwards didn't think Godzilla fighting an alien would go with the balance of nature theme. The many sounds of the Mutos were created by rubbing their hand along a balloon, running a rubber shoe along a drum skin and double bass strings, squeaking the joints of an ironing board and a hat stand, and recording the sounds of a donkey foal. Don't believe me? <laughs> The sound team, led by supervising sound editor and sound designer Eric Adal and supervising sound editor Ethan Van Duren, outdid themselves. The sound of the movie, especially when seen in IMAX, which is what I did when it first came out, was a special experience. Eric Adal and the team would even go live on an aircraft carrier for a little while to record all the sounds of military equipment. The USS Ronald Reagan is a... Uh, a a nuclear aircraft carrier. At the time, it was uh, stationed off the west coast of Mexico. And we did this arrested landing on the deck of this working aircraft oh, carrier, and then lived there for four days. And just got to live with the crew and, you know, hear what it's really like and spend a lot of time up on the flight deck with, you know, fighter jets launching off on sorties. And, you know, we had to sleep with earplugs in our quarters because they'd be running night ops and our whole ceiling would just rattle and <laughs> wake us up. And <laughs> but um, yeah, we got just uh, 
hours and hours and hours of magnificent material. There are really cool looking shots for the Muto coming out party here. The flickering lights definitely add tension. And of course, we have to tip our hat to the very brave cameraman getting so close to this giant monster. But of course, the Mutos are portrayed using computer graphics. It feels weird doing this video and not naming a suit actor. But there was some motion capture done. In the credits, it lists Matt Cross and Lee Ross as motion caption performers. In an earlier draft, the male Muto was supposed to first appear in Hokkaido, but instead they wanted a fictional location. The entire scene would be shot in a sewage plant, and according to Edwards, it smelt exactly as you'd expect it to. Which kind of works, because I'd imagine if the Mutos were real, they would smell like shit. I don't know if I'm the only one who thought of this, but this part here where the Muto's hooks or arms start to grab onto the wire and it makes that noise, it gave me a brief flashback to Jurassic Park when you hear the sounds of the cables being undone and the T-Rex's two claws appear. The Muto causes plenty of chaos before flying away. The motion caption actor for the male Muto would wear a set of wings that he could control with his arms. In an earlier draft, the male Muto would at first not have any wings until later in the movie after a fight with Godzilla. We then see the news flash across the TV screen in the Brody household. The cover story is that an earthquake hit Japan. No mention of a giant monster, but obviously L is concerned. Back in Janjira the next morning, Sarazawa surveys the damage. Oh no, Mikey Palmisi died again. Oh come on, please, please, please. Hopefully the Muto didn't catch poison ivy. Sarazawa is informed that the US Navy is now in charge of this operation. While looking over the dead bodies of his coworkers, he then points the Navy captain to the Brodies, signaling they're needed. Unfortunately, Joe was critically injured during the chaos of the Muto and tells Ford to protect his family before going into AFIV as they land on the USS Saratoga aircraft carrier. A good two minutes later, we find out he's dead. That's it. Cranston's role is just done. I remember being completely stunned by this. I thought Cranston was going to be the guy in this movie. And just 40 minutes and change later, he's gone. Will Ford Brody and Ken Watanabe be able to carry the human cast through this? We'll see. In real life, the USS Saratoga was one of the US Navy's first aircraft carriers and was in service during World War II. After World War II, the ship, which was old and repeatedly damaged, was finally destroyed by nuclear weapons tests. So it's fitting they chose this name for the ship in the movie. Due to the ship being destroyed in real life, the filmmakers used the USS Nimitz, Ronald Reagan, and Carl Vinson to depict the USS Saratoga. On the aircraft carrier, we're introduced to Admiral William Stentz, played by David Strathairn. You know, at times during my reviews of the older Godzilla movies, I would often point out if I found the military characters believable. Actors Jun Tazaki from the Showa era and Akira Nakao from the Heisei and Millennium era were great in those roles because it just seemed believable. They just had the look. And maybe they just conformed to the tough guy image I have of military leaders in my own head. I'll probably get shit for this. But I don't really like Strathairn in this role. The man has been around forever and is a tremendous actor, so it's not about his acting ability that I'm criticizing here. I just think he was miscast. The Admiral tells his crew that he will be pursuing the MUTO, which is the first time in the movie that we hear the acronym. The creature's EMP capabilities have limited the military to a visual pursuit, as the electrical interference messes with their equipment. Elsewhere on the ship, Sarazawa and Vivian tell Ford, yeah, we're sorry about your dead dad, but we're going to show you some cool Godzilla videos now. That's what they do. They give him a huge information dump on the creature that Sarazawa calls... Gojira. Supposedly, Watanabe insisted he say Gojira during this part and not Godzilla, as originally written. I know we technically saw a little of Godzilla in the opening sequence, but I found it sort of unusual they did this big introduction to Godzilla for the audience, uh, I mean Ford, and they did it all before the monster even shows up. Hell, Godzilla hasn't even done anything in the movie yet to impact these characters. It was just a little weird. Godzilla is described by Serizawa as an alpha predator that lived on the surface millions of years ago, when it was more radioactive, but eventually moved underwater and underground to feed on radiation from the Earth's core. 
as the surface radiation subsided. Sarazawa explains that in 1954, the first nuclear submarine, the USS Nautilus, went to the lower depths of the ocean, where it quote-unquote awakened something. Dr. Graham then adds that the multiple atomic tests by the U.S. and Monarch in the 1950s weren't actually tests, but attempts to kill Godzilla, and that Monarch was established in the wake of the discovery of Godzilla and creatures like him. The Russians are also mentioned by Graham, but it's unclear, especially considering the graphic novels, whether they were actually involved in trying to kill Godzilla. Earlier, I mentioned continuity issues when it came to the graphic novels and the movie. In Godzilla Awakening, it stated that Monarch was founded in 1946, but in the movie, they seem to imply that Monarch was started in 1954. On the face of it, these look to be obvious continuity errors, which is unfortunate considering Max Bornstein wrote the movie and Godzilla Awakening. So you don't even have the excuse of two writers doing different things. The MCU knows that struggle. In a tweet, Max covers for this by saying that the conflicting information may just be due to Monarch keeping some things secret from the public. Now, I'm sure someone has gone through all of this to make it so all of the MonsterVerse stuff works together in a nice, neat canon, but I'm not that someone. Again, this is an ongoing series as I'm making this video, so I just can't speak to this stuff with absolute certainty. I can't even tell you the MonsterVerse Godzilla's exact origin, though it is speculated He's been around for quite some time, and maybe we'll find out more as the series goes on. Despite the U.S. military's fear of the monster, Sarazawa believes that Godzilla is nature's way of maintaining balance and is a necessary force in the world. The reason they're showing Ford all of this is they need his help recalling his dad's research or theories. Ford lets them know about his dad's theory regarding the echolocation, which has Sarazawa believing that the Muto is communicating with something else. Funny enough, if you go back to the earlier scene, you do notice a newspaper clipping of Sarazawa on Joe's wall posing as an acoustic expert in the article to dismiss the strange noise regarding the John Jira incident. So it's Monarch doing their part to cover up what really happened, and it's a nice touch as in the real world, whenever some disaster or incident takes place, we often see governments or NGOs giving conflicting information, which makes finding the truth difficult for the average citizen. The Mutos are explained to be a natural enemy to Godzilla, as one of his kind was killed and implanted with the Muto they're dealing with now. See my earlier description of the story of Dagon. Serizawa's fear is that if the Muto is not found soon, nature will call its equalizer to the surface to restore balance. No, not Denzel Washington, Godzilla. After Monarch gets what it needs out of Ford, specifically Joe's research, Ford is brought to Hawaii so he can catch a flight home. On the tram, a small Japanese boy named Akio is interested in the toy soldier that Ford recovered from his house. Unfortunately, he gets separated from his parents and Ford steps in and reassures them in Japanese to stay there and that he will return him. Akio's mom is played by Yuki Morita. She played a role in The Great Buddha Arrival, the movie that was based on the 1934 lost film of the same name, a Japanese kaiju movie that predates Godzilla by 20 years. Akio is played by Jake Kunanen, who doesn't appear to have continued his acting career after this. While this is going on, we hear of a Russian Akula-class submarine that went missing in the Pacific, and now its signal is coming from an island near Honolulu. Navy Special Forces rush to find the sub, and what they find is the Muto having a snack. The Admiral makes it clear there's no hiding it now. However, Serizawa hears over the radio, another blip on the radar is heading to the island. I just remember sitting in the movie theater like, hell yeah, here we go. It's been almost an hour, but finally Godzilla is coming. The US Navy sends an F-35 to take a crack at the male Muto, but the creature's EMP attack easily takes it down, along with knocking out the power on Ford's tram. Considering how much those damn F-35s cost, you'd think they could handle an EMP. Which led me to question, would an EMP knock out a fighter jet? The consensus online seemed to be, it depends. But that aircraft in general are EMP resistant, but not totally immune. I'm sure you military buffs can help me out on this one in the comments. And this is not a nitpick. I'm totally fine with believing that the Muto has some sort of super-powered EMP that could knock out anything. The tension really starts building now. As the beachgoers notice, the water suddenly drain away. 
one of the telltale signs of a tsunami. But we all know who it is. Sarazawa spots the dorsal fins quickly approaching. At least he wasn't fishing. We get a great overhead shot of Godzilla swimming beneath the USS Saratoga. Just some nice shots to further establish how massive he is in this movie. The movie smartly uses a young girl and a dog to get us to actually care about the tsunami scene because of course we don't care about the other people getting swept away and killed. We only care about the dog and the children. I think there was more to Godzilla appearing in this destructive way than simply just spectacle. He's not arriving as some harmless savior, but as a force of nature that will remove anyone and anything standing in its way. Little girl and dog be damned. It's just like all those years ago when the monster appeared in the first movie on Odo Island like a storm itself. Edwards would say, Godzilla is definitely a representation of the wrath of nature. We've taken it very seriously, and the theme is man versus nature, and Godzilla is certainly the nature side of it. You can't win that fight. Nature's always going to win, and that's what the subtext of our movie is about. He's the punishment we deserve. Edwards again teases us by not revealing Godzilla in full yet. We get other characters' reaction to his sheer size, and the uselessness of their weapons against him. There's also what, I mean, I don't know if this is the correct term, but me and my friends have always dubbed it the brown noise. I, I always just think of the South Park episode. But there's this noise that just follows Godzilla in a lot of the shots. I'm not sure if that noise is supposed to be coming from Godzilla or it's just added ambiance to further reinforce how massive he is. I'll assume it's the latter. Ford's tram begins moving again, but to his shock and horror, the Muto is at the other end of the track. Ford finds himself in sort of a Japanese ghost story. His life was touched by this entity at an early age, and it continues to haunt him, no matter how much he removes himself from it in time or space. I've already mentioned this nod to Japanese ghost stories before and in a couple of my videos. It comes from David Callett's description of how the effects of radiation mirror Godzilla. The idea being, even if you survive the initial encounter with radiation or with Godzilla, it'll still come for your life. Here, it's the Muto playing that role for Ford. Though some critics see the Muto just happening to be where Ford is as a plot contrivance or forced coincidence one that could have easily been solved if they kept Joe Brody alive, because he had an actual motive to be following the monsters, to avenge his wife. Whereas Ford is, I don't know, he doesn't really seem to be mad that both his parents were killed by this thing. It sort of reminds me of Godzilla raids again. Everywhere Tsukioka and Kobayashi go, Anguirus and or Godzilla also happen to be there, from the remote islands to Osaka to finally Hokkaido. Once Ford leaves the aircraft carrier, there really is no reason for him to be in the movie anymore. He just wants to go home and be with his family. It's just a coincidence that the Muto attacks where he is. But Joe? Joe would have followed that bastard around the world. As the Muto marches to the airport, there's a nice subtle clue that the star of the show is almost there. Another glimpse of Godzilla is shown as a Black Hawk helicopter opens fire on the Muto with its machine gun. Honolulu International Airport and Tokyo Airport scenes were shot in the Vancouver Convention Center. The chopper is downed and creates a chain reaction of explosions until... I love how the screaming dies down the second Godzilla's foot hits the ground. That, that was a great decision. The chain explosions, the people yelling, it's showing the chaos the Muto is causing, and Godzilla, nature's weapon to restore balance or order, puts his foot down. <laughs> 59 minutes in, and finally, Godzilla fully appears. Legendary's Godzilla was designed by Weta Workshop, a special effects and prop company from New Zealand. For reference, they worked on The Lord of the Rings and 2005's King Kong. Now, of course, Toho was involved in this process as well, and Edwards made sure they approved of the design, and he thought it was important to have this design feel like it was made by Toho. He even went to Japan and did a tour of Toho Studios. Toho was a partner on the movie. 
And I was very lucky that I got to go over there before we started pre-production and meet with the whole studio. I had the whole tour and even got to hold the Oxygen Destroyer, which is what killed Godzilla in the original movie. They even gave us the original sound files for his roar for us to base our roar off. My idea was, imagine that this was a real animal that really existed and back in the 50s. Someone saw this creature and went to Toho Studios and tried to explain what they'd seen this real thing. In our movie, the idea is that this is what they saw for the first time. Producer Thomas Tull wanted the design to be in line with the Toho version. Edwards and the team would review all previous versions of Godzilla. Tull would say, we had to make triply sure we got it right. Godzilla had to look like Godzilla, period. When asked about the TriStar design from 1998, he said, I'm always puzzled as a fan when you take things so far, it's unrecognizable. According to Edwards, it was artist Andrew Baker who had the most influence on the final design and making sure this Godzilla was recognizable to audiences. Baker and fellow artist Christian Pierce, who are big Godzilla fans, argued with Edwards a lot on a few things regarding the design. Edwards had an evolutionary mindset with the Godzilla design. He wanted something that looked like nature created it. The monster's skin texture was chosen to resemble lava with the grooves and pockmarks. The director would work online with Weta's Andrew Baker and tirelessly alter the face model in real time. They would rotate the model to ensure it looked good at every angle. Edwards would say there's always things you regret in filmmaking, but his Godzilla design wasn't one of them. And I happen to agree. I do love the monster vs. Godzilla design. 100 designs were created for Godzilla, and it was an arduous process. I'm showing early designs on screen, which were based on dinosaurs. Godzilla's torso is vertical like the 98 Godzilla or Tyrannosaurus Rex. As they made their way through more designs, they started to hover towards a more traditional look but also borrowing from nature, looking at marine iguanas and oceanic mammals. You have to steal from nature. Nature had billions of years to design Godzilla. We had one year. There was one design that had huge dorsal plates, and the atomic breath effect would look more electrical in nature. Edwards almost chose one of the Godzilla designs that made his plates look fish-like. It made sense to him because Godzilla spends a lot of time in the water. Edwards would decide on this final look instead. For Godzilla's face, they didn't want it to be too round in fear that it would make him look cute, so they went with an angular look. Grizzly bears and dogs were some initial inspirations. At some point, Edwards started looking at the Skeksis from 1982's The Dark Crystal. He asked the designers to try and use birds of prey and vultures as reference points. Edwards chose to give Godzilla gills, and his reasoning made sense but of course he worried about upsetting old-school Godzilla fans. It might make some fans turn in their graves to know that we did this, but if just one thing comes from it, it's well worth it. Well, not to worry, Gareth, I've got your back. Even in the Showa era, Godzilla canonically had gills. According to Tanaka's book, the definitive edition Godzilla introduction, the holes that were sometimes quite visible on the suit, used, of course, for the actor to see and breathe out of, well, according to Tanaka, Those are Godzilla's gills. If I had one word that was most often used to criticize the final Godzilla design created by the team for this movie, it would just be fat. Welcome to the fat club, Brendan. Our boy is a bit tubby in this incarnation. No getting around that. But it's not the first time Godzilla's been chunky. Apparently, the designers even needed to make his legs thinner after the final design was already approved because the thickness of the thighs caused issues when the CG model started moving. Like the Muto, Godzilla is computer-generated, and motion references were performed by TJ Storm. MPC Animation Company would use some of Storm's movements as a basis for the keyframe animation of Godzilla. Despite not being credited, Storm was excited to be part of a project involving Godzilla nonetheless, and stated the first ever Godzilla movie he saw was Godzilla vs. Hedera. Funny enough, that's the movie that got Kurt Carley into suit acting. He was credited as the creature motion specialist from the 1998 Godzilla movie. 
And I highly encourage people to look up interviews of TJ Storm. Seems like a really cool guy. Normally, I give a few stats on the monsters when I introduce them. Legendary gave us the whole rundown of physical statistics. His height is 355 feet, making this the tallest Godzilla ever at the time. That wouldn't last long, though. Early on, the idea was tossed around he would be 600 feet. We wanted him big enough that you could see him through the skyscrapers, but he's not so big that he could never be hidden, because when he's omnipresent in every single shot, it takes some of the fun out of the sequences you could do. His tail is roughly 550 feet. He has a total of 89 dorsal plates running down his back and tail. He has a volume of 89,724 cubic meters. His feet are 58 feet wide and 60 feet long. Sound designer Eric Adal would take the original sound effect provided by Toho, and with his fellow sound designer Ethan Van Duren, they would spend six months creating the roar. The original Godzilla roar from 1954 is probably the most famous sound effect in film history. If you're going to create the Godzilla roar, you have to use the original template as your jumping off point. <laughs> The original roar was created by a leather glove and a double bass, right? We reproduced that experiment, but we wanted to continue exploring. Sounds that are inaudible to humans, along with other sounds that match the classic roar, would be worked in. The team would create and test a total of 50 roars before landing on the one they wanted. As we were working on the roar, we kind of broke it down into two parts, the initial shriek and the finishing bellow. To me, both parts have different emotional reactions. The initial is the fury of nature, and the finish is this knowing, this understanding that conveys a deeper, richer soul. And ultimately, when you give voice to something, you are giving it its soul. According to Adal, they would land on a metallic sound. Dried ice supercools certain types of metal, and it starts contracting and vibrating and produces this shrieking and bellowing. And for the tail end of the roar, they recorded a potted plant moving across concrete and edited it further. In order to test the roar, they would go to the back lot at Warner Brothers and use a speaker array once used for the Rolling Stones. The crew would send flyers notifying the surrounding area that there would be some loud Godzilla noises about to happen. But it did little to stop the police department in the area from getting phone calls. And a few people in the area would post on social media that Godzilla was outside. The crew estimated that in the test they ran, Godzilla's roar could be heard from three miles away. When I first heard the roar in IMAX, I could feel my insides shake. It didn't disappoint. All right, we're finally about to see Godzilla square off against the male Muto, and no, I guess we're not. Instead, we see some parts of the fight on the television that Sam is watching from home while Elle is trying to put him to bed. Mommy, look! Dinosaur! It's humorous. In fact, it might be the only funny scene in the entire movie. And in a way, the whole scene could represent the way the Godzilla character has changed over the years. From the deadly monster that killed many when he first arrived on the scene, to then becoming a savior, defending humanity against other threats to the delight of kids watching on their television. And that's all well and good. But I think this was a huge misfire to not show the fight after we waited an hour for Godzilla's first real arrival. And I remember at the time going, what the hell? They built up the tension in this scene beautifully, too. And it sort of gets ruined. There's no payoff. It's really not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to have the big battle. And I love the fact we don't. And I love the fact we hold back. Edward's justification would be that it also made the ending fight that much more satisfying. Sure, it was mildly funny to see Sam watching it, but you could have shown both. You could have had that scene with Sam and Elle and still showed the whole fight. I get Edwards was trying to continuously build Godzilla up more and more as the movie went on, which is great. It's beyond great that he had so much reverence for the monster. I love that. But just in terms of pure entertainment, I thought it was a bad decision. We fast forward to the next morning to see the destruction caused by the battle. Would have been nice to actually see it. Akio gets reunited with his parents and Ford learns that Godzilla and the Muto are heading east towards the continental US. 
The Hawaii scenes were all filmed on location in June and July of 2013 in Honolulu. Over 2,000 people applied to be extras, with 200 being hired. In an interview, Aaron Taylor Johnson described the filming as mostly on location with very little use of green screens. He described the film crew as fairly small compared to other films he has worked on. One of the coolest shots in the movie comes here. We see the U.S. Navy alongside Godzilla hunting the MUTO. It's like the Navy is Godzilla's special escort. Aboard the Saratoga, Sarazawa comes to the conclusion that the MUTO is communicating with the other spore that Monarch had previously transferred to Nevada at the Yucca Mountain Nuclear Waste Repository. In the real world, the Yucca Mountain Project is to comply with the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982 and establish a place where the U.S. can put high-level radioactive waste. Due to lawsuits and other safety concerns, the project was continuously delayed despite a tunnel being built. As of 2024, it is still not in use and may never be. The U.S. still does not have a long-term repository for nuclear waste. Instead, the military and power plants use dry cast storage. But in this universe, the Yucca Mountain is the temporary home of the female Muto Spore. The military discovers the female has broken out, and Las Vegas is about to get a very big visitor. The female MUTO is larger than the male, but has no wings. But more significantly, it has an EMP sphere of influence around it that stretches a great distance, knocking airplanes out of the sky that cross the sphere's path. The female MUTO's motion caption actor wore two prosthetic legs and used crutches to portray the female's knuckle walking. Oh, and by the way, remember people thinking these here were possibly the Shobijin in the trailer? Nope, just firefighters. Adding to the trouble, Sarazawa theorizes that the male and female Muto are trying to meet up to reproduce. The military's plan is to lure both the Mutos and Godzilla out to sea where they'll then detonate a nuclear device. This didn't work when they tried decades ago on Godzilla, but Captain Hampton, played by Richard T. Jones, is confident it'll work, because according to him, the nuclear bombs they have now will make the original bombs they tried to kill it with, quote, look like a firecracker, end quote. Some have pointed out this line may be a mistake. Here's why. If we assume the same yield of weapon was used during Castle Bravo in this movie's universe as in real life, well, that's the largest bomb the U.S. has ever detonated. It was measured in megatons. Perhaps the writers were thinking of the World War II bombs when writing this line. Anyway, Serizawa opposes this plan, suggesting they let Godzilla handle the Mutos. The Admiral disagrees. We then learn that Ishiro's dad, Eiji Serizawa, was a survivor of the Hiroshima bombing, and so the doctor makes sure to show the Admiral his father's watch, stopped at precisely 8.15 in the morning, when, for the first time, an atomic bomb was dropped. Showing that watch was all he needed to do to explain why he opposes the plan. In a Guardian article talking about the U.S. military's assistance in making Hollywood movies, Godzilla comes up. And according to that article, the Pentagon had an issue with the Serizawa character referencing the Hiroshima bombing. If this is an apology or questioning of the decision to bomb Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that will be a showstopper for us. I'm not sure of the validity of this because the article says the scene was removed, but obviously it wasn't. Though in an earlier draft, the Sarazawa character gives a more graphic speech about his father's experiences after the atomic bombing. So maybe that specifically was what they objected to and got removed. Ford is able to talk himself into the mission and onto the train transporting several of the nukes to San Francisco, as his expertise in demolitions will come in handy. And it's just another funny coincidence that both the Mutos and Godzilla are on a collision course for San Francisco, where his family is. The nukes they have won't detonate by remote control because of the MUTO's EMP, so they're preparing to use nukes equipped with analog timers. Unfortunately for Ford and his new buddy Morales, they have a close encounter with the female MUTO. But I remember just zoning out during this part on my first watch, and believe me, I was pumped up to see that movie, so this scene just did not do it for me at all. I just don't think we needed a drawn out sequence of soldiers in the dark somehow getting snuck up on by a 300 foot monster. In my opinion, this entire part could have been cut. 
you can establish that the Mutos get a warhead another way. And as we'd see, they do, when the male steals one from the military later on. It also happens to be the same nuke that the military transfers via helicopter, which begs the question, why didn't they just do that to begin with? They're aware of the MUTO EMP range, and as we'll see later, they're able to get to a high enough altitude to avoid it as well. So now we're an hour and 20 minutes in, and haven't really seen Godzilla do anything other than a few shots of him on television and him cause a tsunami with his fat legs. Ford survives his encounter with the female MUTO, but Morales does not. Victor Rasik, sayonara, we hardly knew you. The military also retrieves the remaining nuclear warhead. San Francisco begins evacuating people on school buses, and Elle allows Sam to go with her friend while she stays at the hospital, still waiting for Ford to get his ass over there. While the bus Sam's on is crossing the Golden Gate Bridge, the military's aware that the Mutos and Godzilla are on a collision course, putting everyone on the bridge in jeopardy. Here we get one of the better scenes in the movie. The military is bracing to try and stop or at least slow down an unstoppable force. Most of the military vehicles are created with CGI. The team would digitize military equipment from the 7th Infantry Division of the U.S. Army. Just like with the aircraft, the sound crew would go to Fort Irwin out in California to record sounds of tanks crushing cars and whatnot. Uh, John Fasol did a ton of recording for us, and um, it was Eric Potter who... Um flew out to Fort Irwin, where they were doing all sorts of tank training and maneuvers. Mm -hmm. And Fort Irwin's kind of interesting because it's built, there's this huge city that's built there that's used for training dudes to do <laughs> missions, you know, how to, uh, how to cover each other and how to move into buildings safely and yeah. all of that kind of thing. So they do all these sorts of staged firefights. And yeah, no, so we have a liaison, you know, a military liaison that helps coordinate all of that. Okay. Sam's bus is waiting on the bridge and they're all completely oblivious until they hear the roar. When the monster arrives, the military panics and starts firing missiles. Godzilla actually saves some people by blocking a few of them. The bus driver is the smartest man in the entire movie. Pedal to the metal, regardless of what the authorities are telling him to do. The kids scream, but I'm pretty sure you can hear one of them yelling, this is awesome. <laughs> Godzilla will always be cool to kids, even when he almost kills them. In order to help get some realistic screams and sounds from the kids, they had a guy in a mask scare the shit out of them. You know, it's often a challenge working with kids because, you know, you ask them to scream and they'll give you a real canned scream. Yeah. You know, it sounds like a kid just screaming for a microphone. Okay. And it's a little harder to get a true panic feeling. And so <laughs> Gareth started brainstorming with us well how do we do this and he was he was de he was describing this one um uh, thing called the alien experience he'd gone to in london uh -huh. where they would they turn off all the lights in, in this venue and mm -hmm. a strobe light would flash on and you'd see like this alien 50 feet away One of the coolest shots in the movie is here. Godzilla just sort of in the background, trudging through water after he bursts through the bridge with jets overhead. Just a beautiful picture. Though I guess the bridge probably should have collapsed, but who cares? Riggiel said the team used panorama photos of the San Francisco skyline and made a three-dimensional map of the city. Katsuhiro Otomo's Akira and Steven Spielberg's works influenced the design and cinematography of this film. Edward stated, one of our designers on the film, a friend called Matt, when we were designing things and got stuck, we'd always go, what would Akira do? He wanted a documentary vibe with, quote, also that classic Spielberg style, end quote. Which fits. If you watch the movie Monsters, there are times in that movie when it feels like you are watching a documentary. Edward set rules for himself. He didn't want to have shots in places where cameras wouldn't normally be able to go. Though he admits he had to cheat at times because it was impossible for him to tell his story without some wide shots of the monsters fighting. Thank God he cheated. As cool as Godzilla's entrance into San Francisco is, the Mutos have him beat. Just as the warhead timer is activated, the EMP hits, and this right here was brilliant. Fighter jets begin raining from the sky along with the male Muto, who gets what he's after, a warhead which he presents to the female. As I've said, I find the EMP ability of the Mutos to be an awesome idea. Edwards also liked how it acted as a calling card, 
You see all the lights go out and think. Oh shit. And here you finally get to see the size difference between them. The female begins making a nest in San Francisco's Chinatown. It really is admirable how much thought was put into almost every aspect of the Mutos. I particularly like this quote from Ethan Van Durine. These creatures are close to blind and find their way by bouncing sound off the surroundings. When they sound off, you hear them and the reflections of the environment. The two creatures have never met, but are linked and fated for each other to mate and reproduce. I find them engaging. It makes you want to try and understand them. Here, Elizabeth Olsen got to participate in the decades-long tradition of looking up and pretending you're seeing a giant monster and awkwardly running away from nothing. Elle is caught between the male Muto and Godzilla. All right, here we go. Gareth wouldn't do this to us again. We're about to finally see some monster son of a bitch. Though myself and I'm sure others found Edward's approach to be frustrating, Brian Cranston had his director's back. Comparing Edward's approach to Steven Spielberg's and Jaws, where the movie builds up the shark's appearance with its off-screen presence being enough to satisfy people until then. Edward's wanted that, quote, sense of anticipation, end quote. He cited Alien, Jaws, and Close Encounters of the Third Kind as influences. The question of whether you enjoyed this movie or not probably hinges a lot on Edward's decision to go with this approach. Did you find the movie entertaining enough to get through before we finally see Godzilla battle the Mutos in full? I mean, if most of the movie is going to focus on something other than Godzilla, that other thing better be fascinating enough. At times, this movie felt more like a Muto movie than a Godzilla movie. The military's plan is to get into the city and deactivate the bomb before it goes off. They say the EMPs from the Mutos is frying electronics within a five mile bubble, so approaching from the ground is not an option. So they suggest flying over the city and doing a halo drop. Unfortunately, we live in a time where trailers increasingly show you the entirety of a movie. When it came to this movie, Dr. Sarazawa's most memorable line was well known way before the movie even came out. And it, of course, involved the doctor once again disagreeing with the military's plan and offering his own unique solution to the problem. Let them fight. It's a pretty meta line, too, if you take into account we have been waiting 90 damn minutes for the monsters to fight and still haven't really gotten a good look. So when Sarazawa said this, I was like, yeah, let's let's go. Come on. There's a funny story out there that a mosquito landed on Watanabe's nose during one of the takes during this part, and he supposedly quipped, let them bite. The halo jump scene was also featured heavily in the trailers. In fact, there are parts in the trailers that were cut from the final version of the film. To say this scene was important to Edwards would be an understatement. Before he was even hired, Edwards had this scene in his head, and he would use pre-production material to show Legendary his vision. Edwards wanted to convey that these men were angels about to jump into hell, so he made sure to have someone on the plane reading a prayer beforehand. The director would even confirm with the military that the red smoke was something they actually use. In the movie, the men jump out of a C-17 Globemaster, but the crew would film footage of special forces jumping out of a C-130 to use for some of the footage. They would then have a grounded C-17 and film the men jumping onto green screen mats. Eventually, all of this footage would be merged with CG for the finished product. The visuals are quite something here, but it's the music that adds a certain dread and surrealism to the scene. Edwards would explain it was just the random will of his iPhone that selected the song titled Requiem, which was written by... You know what? There's not a chance I pronounced this correctly. Let's have Google do it. Jordi Ligeti. There you go. Anyway, his work was also famously used in the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey, amongst other movies, despite never composing any film scores directly. Taylor Johnson would get some training from retired Marine Sergeant Major James D. Dever, one of the advisors from the U.S. Army. They did this to ensure that he had some good military bearing. We do see some shots of Godzilla and the Mutos fighting, but again, it's not easy to see because it's from Ford's perspective while he's doing the halo jump. 
The little device they have shows them where the warhead is. Wait, I thought all electronics were fried. Oh well. Just as they're approaching the nest and female Muto, Godzilla arrives as well. Another fantastic visual here. The crew built this San Francisco Chinatown street along with parts of the giant sinkhole set and Muto nest from earlier in the movie at the Canadian Motion Picture Park a massive film production center located in Burnaby, British Columbia. Now, if the first big roar from the Hawaii scene shook my insides, this one with those IMAX speakers almost killed me. The two monsters approach each other, and is that, is that a wide shot? We made it, folks. Yes, the monsters are fighting, and we can actually see what the hell is going on. Sort of, depending on the version you watch. In theaters, it was easy to see mostly everything despite the nighttime setting. Now, I own both the Blu-ray and the 4K Ultra HD version. The footage I've been using in this video is mostly ripped from the Blu-ray. But funny enough, I actually can't watch the 4K Ultra HD version because nothing I have in my house plays it. So that's why I just ripped the Blu-ray, that was easier. So I'm not using 4K footage here in my video. But judging from the pictures online, there's quite a difference here. But what seems to be the consensus is that the theatrical version had it the best, and it was bright enough to see what was going on, and the standard Blu-ray media transfer pissed a lot of people off because you had to adjust your TV settings to increase the brightness. A Reddit user posted a comparison. You know, I'll be honest, I don't remember it being that stark of a difference, so I don't know how legitimate this is. I'm just going off my memory on this one. I will say, though, that the clips of the movie from the behind the scenes and extra features from the Blu-ray, those are brighter. They may have botched the Blu-ray release, but the Warner Brothers YouTube channel did do something pretty cool while promoting it. They uploaded an 8-bit or 16-bit video game-like montage of parts from the movie. Now, while on the topic of Warner Brothers, I'd just like to say, trying to keep this video on YouTube without getting copyright strikes has been an absolute nightmare. Toho always gets the bad reputation for that, but I've never experienced as many problems uploading a video as I have with this one. And I'm sure you noticed, but even small clips like Godzilla roaring had to be edited down because of what I'm guessing is Warner Brothers strict content ID settings. I can't claim to know how the mechanics work, but again, I've never dealt with this with Toho, so I think it's more of a Warner Brothers issue than a YouTube issue. So yeah, I had to take down a video that already had thousands of views because of whatever happened there. All right then, whatever uh, happened there? According to Jim Regal, the fighting style they gave Godzilla was primarily influenced by bears and Komodo dragons. As for the battle effects, Regal said that they were in the spirit of the original series and that Godzilla would be, quote, more dynamic than a guy in a big rubber suit, end quote. The last 25 minutes of the movie switch back and forth between Godzilla's handicap match with the Mutos and the military's attempt to disarm the bomb. Unfortunately, Ford's sole purpose on the mission is a moot point. They can't open the bomb in order for him to disarm it. So he decides to make himself useful. While the others work to transfer the bomb to his ship and sail it away, Brody sets fire to the nest of the Muto, destroying the fertilized eggs before they can infest the earth. Godzilla gets his ass kicked for a good portion of the fight, being it's two-on-one. For people who complained about this, for example, maybe people were going, what the hell, he's supposed to be this big alpha predator, he's the king of monsters, blah blah blah, and now he's getting his ass kicked. Well, yeah, welcome to a Godzilla movie. Godzilla gets his ass kicked in almost every movie, but... He always gets back up until he wins. Godzilla's durability is one of his main powers. Ford's attack on the nest proves beneficial to Godzilla as the female gets distracted. The noises coming out of the Muto here are pretty disturbing and you feel bad for it for a second. And then you start laughing because you remember where the sounds originated from. Unfortunately for Ford, he couldn't get out of there fast enough, and the female has him in her sights. Just when you think Ford's done for, a blue light appears, and as the camera pans, we see it's Godzilla's dorsal fins lighting up one by one. And can we just take a second to admire this stunning shot here? Just incredible. Godzilla puffs his chest, and then...
Man, I had goosebumps. Atomic Breath has finally come to a live action American Godzilla movie. The artists I mentioned earlier, who are the big Godzilla fans, Christian Pierce and Andrew Baker, we can thank them because remember how I said they argued with Edwards on certain things? This was one of those things. According to Godzilla, the official movie novelization and an earlier screenplay, Godzilla's atomic breath is somewhat neutralized by the MUTO's EMP, which is described as an evolutionary defense mechanism that would snuff out the, quote, bioelectric spark in Godzilla's throat, end quote. If you only watched the movie, then it would be impossible to determine whether it was actually weakened here. We know from future films it definitely looks stronger, though you could argue that's because Godzilla himself is growing more powerful in each movie. It would have been very Gareth Edwards if Godzilla puffed his chest up, went to shoot, and nothing came out. And we were teased and given nothing because of this Muto EMP ability blocking the atomic breath. I, I swear, I think if that would have happened... I would have walked out of the theater at that point. That would have just been mean by Gareth. Just as us Godzilla fans are freaking out over the atomic breath, the King of Monsters delivers another badass move. The male Muto is killed and paled onto the large building. I'm not familiar with the San Francisco skyline, but some say this is the 50 California Street building, and I've seen others say this is the 44 Montgomery building that the MUTO was impaled on. If you happen to know, put it in the comments. The sound team made the perfect sound effect for that. Just a very satisfying crunch. I also love how they show Godzilla's eyes. He's so done with this flying asshole. Accomplished actor, author, director, and motion capture master Andy Serkis was brought in to consult on the movie, and we can thank him for Godzilla's expressive eye movements. Just as Godzilla is feeling like he's really accomplishing something, he realizes he's about to pay a price for using the large structure as a weapon. The building collapses on Godzilla, who falls to the ground right next to Ford. Ford and Godzilla make eye contact here, which is a pattern I notice in Western giant monster movies often. Uh, there's usually some sort of human connection put into it, perhaps inspired by King Kong. It's not non-existent in Godzilla's history, but it's definitely rare for him to interact or even acknowledge individuals. Even in Godzilla vs. the Sea Monster, he's only flirting with Kumi Mizuno because it was originally supposed to be King Kong in the story. But I guess I like to see this moment as sort of a reflection of how both Ford and Godzilla are trying to bring order to all this chaos. Big Mama kills the troops loading the bomb onto the boat while another group of soldiers try to draw her away. And I'm sure most Godzilla fans saw the obvious reference here, Go Whales Tours. A little tip of the hat to how Godzilla got his name. Ford makes an attempt to get the boat going only for it to stop working because because I assume the EMP ability. Ford then sees death staring him in the face. Just as he looks screwed, Godzilla then proceeds to do whatever the hell you want to call this. I've heard fans call it the kiss of death, with both Gareth Edwards and TJ Storm telling slightly differing tales about how it came to be. Storm recalls being given a Barney head to wear while doing his takes, but refusing to wear it. So one of the Muto motion reference actors wore it instead, and in one take, Storm grabbed the mask off the actor who fell to the ground. Then with the mask in his hands, on a whim, he said, hey, it'd be pretty cool if I blew fire into this, and he acted it out. What happens if I, what happens if I just, like, pull his jaws apart and I blow fire into his mouth? Is that a good way to kill him? And everybody's like... In a tweet, Edwards would say he came up with the idea as a joke. I'm just speculating, but it's possible both stories are true. Maybe Storm did it during his takes, the animators showed it to Edwards, and he said, hey... That'd be a pretty funny idea if we really did this. No more Mutos. Godzilla is victorious. With the Mutos dead, the electronics in the vicinity start working again. Both Godzilla and Ford collapse. Their fight is finally over. Luckily, Ford is rescued by the military, and then the bomb does detonate out at sea. 
The next day, Ford, Sam, and Elle all reunite. And honestly, who cares? They just weren't real characters. <laughs> Godzilla awakens, locks eyes with Sarazawa, and triumphantly marches towards the sea like we've seen so many times before. He's given the nickname by the media, King of the Monsters, and Savior of the City. It's good to be the king. <sighs> One last iconic roar, Godzilla heads out to sea. And on that last shot of the water, the movie ends. Godzilla released to American theaters on May 16th, 2014, and would go on to sell roughly 23 million tickets. The movie had the biggest opening day box office of 2014 at the time it came out, bringing in over $38 million. By the end of its theatrical run, the movie would earn over $200 million in the U.S., a big success. And remember earlier when I mentioned the new analytical marketing they implemented? Yeah, me neither. Point is, it seems to have worked because the movie made more than projected and Legendary spent less on marketing than it had on past projects. American film critics gave it relatively positive reviews, praising the visuals, the tremendous sound effects, and respect for Godzilla history. The most common criticisms of the film are the characters and limited Godzilla screen time. Another common critique is killing off Joe Brody so early in the movie. Cranston would even later say that was a, quote, narrative mistake, end quote. In Japan, they would help promote the movie by building a 22-foot statue of the new Godzilla in Tokyo Midtown Garden in Roppongi. The statue would even light up at night. In order to expand Godzilla's audience demographics, Toho would hold an event called Girl Meets Godzilla to try and get young women interested in seeing the new Godzilla movie. I don't know what that's about. The ladies love Godzilla. But of course, whether man, woman, boy, or girl, the Godzilla fans in Japan are prideful of their monster, and they were happy to see him return. エガスターじゃないかなと。できたら福岡を壊してほしいです。ゴジラお帰り。ああ、ですね、ジャパンプレミアエンドソーワンダフルアンドグレイトナイト。ああ、ですね、ジャパンプレミアエンドソーワンダ
the two creative pillars that Toho stood on for so many years. Some have pointed out that 2014's Godzilla's plot is strikingly similar to 1995's Gamera, Guardian of the Universe. In that movie, Gamera appears to fight an ancient enemy who made a nest in the center of the city, which Gamera and the monster fight in to end the movie. Edwards didn't release Godzilla in 3D, but it was post-converted, making this the first Godzilla movie to be released in 3D, if you don't count the short movie Monster Planet Godzilla for the Japanese theme park Sanrio Puro Land. Which is pretty funny considering this all started with Bono trying to make a 3D Godzilla movie. Later on in 2014, a video game titled Godzilla was released for the PS3 and PS4 on December 18th in Japan, and it would come to North America and Europe in July of 2015. At the time, I didn't know anything about the game until my friend purchased it for me on my birthday, and I'm really happy he did because apparently it's tough to get nowadays without paying a lot. It's a fun game. I did a stream on my channel playing it once, but I played the shit out of it when I first got it. There were other popular Godzilla games between 2000 and 2015 as well, like Godzilla Save the Earth and Godzilla Unleashed, and of course, Godzilla Destroy All Monsters Melee. But I always saw those as purely fighting games. Godzilla 2014 is not doing anything exceptional in the fighting game category, I'd say, but as someone once described it, I think they did it on my stream, it's not really a fighting game, it's a Godzilla movie simulator. If this game came out when I was eight years old, I would never have came out of my room. You can even fight classic monsters and the 2014 Godzilla appears. And Hotel Gracery Shinjuku appears as a destructible building as well. Getting back to the movie itself, in my videos I often cite the analysis of different film historians and writers who have written books about the Godzilla movies. So, what did the keepers of Godzilla history think of 2014's Godzilla? I already shared some of Steve Rifle's thoughts earlier. On a thematic note, he found the movie to be about nothing. Ouch. Ed Godzichewski, who helped co-author Godzilla-related books with Rifle, would have this to say. The 2014 film paid superficial lip service at best to the nuclear issue. But really, there's almost nothing of substance there. Rather than offering caution about nuclear energy, the new film almost gives you the idea that nuclear weapons are actually the answer to everything. Despite that analysis, he did say that he enjoyed the movie overall and liked the fight choreography. What did David Callett think? Callett thought Edwards gave Godzilla a quote, modern American context, end quote, when it came to the depiction of the military. For his part, John LeMay pointed out that this movie's story was remarkably similar to Terry Razio and Ted Elliott's attempt at a Godzilla movie back in 1994. Some similarities include the story opening with an accident that involves a family member dying and having the movie fast forward roughly a decade or more afterwards, with the 1994 story having a mother and daughter duo and here we get a father and son. A funny theory LeMay has is that the proposed opening to the 2014 movie I mentioned earlier with Godzilla being found in ice, but then getting rejected due to Man of Steel doing something similar, LeMay proposes that might be bullshit, and the real reason they scrapped it was because it was way too similar to the 1994 proposed story. And finally, what are my overall thoughts on the movie? In short, I loved it when I first saw it, it achieved what the TriStar Godzilla failed to do, bringing a big budget cinematic Godzilla to the United States that was a good balance of its own thing, but not straying too far from what makes Godzilla, Godzilla. Now, my more extensive thoughts. If I was just judging this movie based off its visuals, sound design, creature design, the sets, all the dedication to detail, I'd consider this a great movie. Unfortunately, the human characters and narrative decisions hamper this movie's rewatch value, and the decision to repeatedly tease a watchable, clearly seen monster fight, I mean, that decision, that, that was not my favorite. Maybe if this was a solo Godzilla movie, that approach would have worked better. But if you're telling us that giant monsters are fighting in your movie, then just show us, man. In fairness to Edwards, years later, during a watch-along online, he would poke fun at himself for this approach. And look, when they finally did fight, and it was easily viewable, it was everything I wanted it to be. The final battle was tremendous. It was why I purchased my ticket. That fight was 
that was what I wanted since I was 10 years old. A big Hollywood budget with Godzilla doing Godzilla things. Shooting atomic breath, kicking ass. It was amazing. As far as Godzilla's screen time, you know, I don't put too much stock into that uh, because that could be a little deceptive. As long as you do entertaining things with him while he is on the screen, it isn't that critical. Unfortunately, Edwards did relegate Godzilla to the background way too much. John LeMay even pointed out how Godzilla's appearances in this movie almost mirror how he showed up in Terra of Mechagodzilla, a movie I love. But the story in that movie is way more interesting. The middle part of Edward's movie is just its downright boring at times, and the lack of any levity or humor in the script also makes it painful to get through. No, I don't need Marvel-esque quips every five seconds, but the script just seems so lifeless. I, I get Edwards was going for a serious approach, but I just didn't buy it. It's hard to capture what 1954 did. That movie could get away with the script being as dour as it was. As David Callett said, the 1954 movie was, quote, very specific to its cultural moment, end quote. And for an American Godzilla movie to, quote, try and chase that darkness, end quote, is perhaps pointless. Now, all that being said, this movie will always have a special place in my heart. It rejuvenated my own love of this franchise that had honestly gone dormant, relegated to just member berries in my brain. Additionally, it finally got the movie star that is Godzilla right in America. My problems with the story and script aside, I do think this did the character of Godzilla justice, even if the mood didn't capture some of the essence of the original. So thank you, Gareth Edwards, for that. Rifle's critique of the movie seems to be coming from a place of wanting that 1954 feel, or at least for the movie to be saying something on a societal level. To Rifle, the beautiful visuals were, quote, hollow exercises in technical prowess, end quote. To him, again, the movie just meant nothing. Now, Edwards obviously meant to say something in terms of the environment as per Bono's influence. Whether that came across clearly enough or wasn't specific enough for Rifle's liking, I don't know. However, I don't need a Godzilla movie to do that to enjoy it. I've talked about this before. You can do a Godzilla movie with no societal message in it. You can do a movie with implicit messages. You can do ones with explicit messages. The history of this series is so vast and diverse. To me, there really is no one way to make a great Godzilla movie. There's multiple ways to get there. I mean, look at Godzilla Minus One. It has plenty to say in it. But you're still going to get people unhappy with that movie because even though it's saying a bunch it wasn't commenting exactly on what they wanted it to touch on. I mean, I guess the point I'm making is you're never going to make everyone happy. Now, the 2014 Godzilla's legacy is debated quite a bit. From my perspective, when it first came out, the only other point of reference we had for an American Godzilla movie was the 1998 one, which is why you see me comparing the two at times in this video. It was a relevant conversation back then despite how tired some of you think criticism of that movie is at this point. But as the years have passed and we've seen this MonsterVerse movie series grow, and over in Japan the likes of Shin Godzilla and Godzilla Minus One be released, the topic has changed to whether Gareth Edwards' Godzilla is responsible for all of that. And by extension, Yoshimitsu Bano, who started all of this. I would say more than anything, the story of Godzilla 2014 and its impact on the Godzilla franchise is one of redemption for Bono and one about the rejuvenation of a franchise for a new generation. <laughs> You showed them, Bono. You showed them. Rest easy. Now, would there be Shin Godzilla and Godzilla Minus One and the other media we've seen over the years if not for this movie? I would say on a surface level, there seems to be a pretty straightforward cause and effect between 2014 Godzilla and Shin Godzilla. But anything after that, I won't speak to because there's just too many variables. And I know even that's a broad generalization. I understand we all have our own stories of how we came to be Godzilla fans. 
I would still be a Godzilla fan, even if there were no Godzilla movies the last two decades. But I don't believe there would be as many Godzilla fans as there are today if we didn't get the MonsterVerse or the early Reiwa era movies. Back in Japan, Toho was thrilled with how well the American Godzilla movie did. So they said, you know what? Let's strike while the iron's hot and once again bring Godzilla back to Japan. With a cinematic monsterverse starting in the US and the dawn of the Reiwa era of Godzilla in Japan, we were about to enter a new golden age of kaiju content. Next up, it's 2016's Shin Godzilla. <laughs> 